Good morning, Aubrey. How are you? Uh, thank you for the kind flowers. I think um, it was great. You know, I wish I could have been there. Oh, no, no, it was, it was great. It was, uh, Can I have everybody take seats? We're going to go ahead and get the workshop meeting of the Commonwealth Transportation Board for May 2017 underway. Uh, but of course, before we start, if you'd all please, now that you've seated, please stand so we can say the Pledge of Allegiance. A pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So please be seated. Um, I did want to recognize, uh, we have a couple <laughs> members that are not here today. Gary Garzinski uh, had said he was not going to be here. But we just found out that um, Marty, who was here last evening, Marty Williams, uh, had to return to Richmond because of uh, an issue with one of his children. So um, we wish uh, Marty the best in, 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 uh, in terms of coming uh, uh, to grips with that situation. Um, Carol, uh, no, we're still missing Mr. Fralin, but he's supposed to be here. Okay, so he'll be, he'll be coming here soon. But we do have a quorum. We have a fairly uh, uh, full agenda. So from administratively, what's going to happen today, um, we're going to go till noon. Uh, we do have a hard break at noon. Um, not only for lunch, but uh, for you guys. Uh, one of the things we heard too was um, you would like a little bit of extra time, some, you know, in terms of being here for two days. So you'll have a tour this afternoon, but also a little bit of free time to yourselves. I think dinner's a little bit later. And in all full disclosure, uh, uh, that's because, uh, part of it's because Mr. Donahue and I will be getting on a plane. We're going to Washington this afternoon. We're testifying in front of uh, a Senate committee on P3s. And so we we'll hopefully we'll be back here in time for dinner uh, this evening. So that's what will be going on. What we don't um, finish today in the workshop, so our people in the audience know, that'll be our first board of business tomorrow morning. If we don't, we start at what time tomorrow? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock tomorrow. So if we finish, that will be a public comment. If we don't finish, we'll continue um, the workshop session uh, and then have uh, public comment on well, that. I think uh, Mr. Rosen has been in uh, in charge of uh, the activities tonight. So that's an overstatement. Yeah, but that's it. <laughs> yeah we look. Uh, Mathis we'll, is in we'll, charge. We'll, we look forward to you. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, let me welcome. Are there any elected officials here? Well. Anybody that is here, please uh, thank you that you are here. Uh, all the members in the audience, we appreciate uh, being here in the great uh, city of Roanoke uh, and uh, look forward to this evening and tomorrow uh, being in your community. All right, first off, let's have uh, uh, Ken King, our district administrator, has got a, a couple words of welcome and some things to talk with us. Ken, good to see you. Mr. Secretary, members of the board, thank you very much. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Salem District and to the uh, beautiful Roanoke Valley. Uh, indeed, I am blessed to serve VDOT here in the beautiful Southwest Virginia. I want to begin, uh, as I think you've seen in some other districts, a real brief video about the Salem District and, and the community that we serve here. Nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains, the western region of Virginia is one of the state's most scenic. Its beauty provides the backdrop to the region's small towns, rural counties, and urban communities which support an outstanding quality of life. The area offers amazing outdoor destinations like Smith Mountain Lake, the Appalachian Trail, and the Blue Ridge Parkway. Thousands of people visit each year to watch races at the Martinsville Speedway and listen to music at the Old Fiddler's Convention in Galax. More than three quarters of a million people live in Western Virginia, which is home to the Roanoke Valley, the state's largest population center west of Richmond. In the New River Valley, Virginia Tech, the state's second largest university, 
is located in Blacksburg, Virginia's most populous town. To keep a diversity of transportation users moving in Western Virginia, VDOT's Salem District oversees a complex network of roads through one of the most challenging terrains in the Commonwealth. The district is comprised of 12 counties and 14 cities and towns covering 5,500 square miles. Salem District's 493 lane miles of interstate highway include I-81, one of the top trucking routes in the U.S. The section between Roanoke and Christiansburg is among the most heavily traveled in Virginia and has the greatest change in grade. Carrying more than 75,000 vehicles a day through the Metro Roanoke area, Interstate 581 is the state's most heavily traveled road west of Richmond. The district's transportation network includes nearly 2,600 lane miles of primary roads and 14,700 miles of secondary roads, more than any other district in the state. Located in Blacksburg, Vinot Smart Road is a state-of-the-art transportation research facility managed by the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Scientists and product developers experiment with emerging innovations such as connected and autonomous vehicles, which are expected to revolutionize the transportation industry. Salem District also houses VDOT's statewide customer service center. The CSC allows Virginians to connect with representatives 24-7 to report problems on state-maintained roads and request maintenance services. The district is also home to one of VDOT's five regional transportation operations centers. The Salem TOC coordinates incident response for about a third of Virginia's counties and communicates the latest traffic information to motorists through message boards and the 511 information system. The district is home to four residency offices and 27 area headquarters, each serving as a field office so employees can deliver essential road maintenance to keep Western Virginia moving. Almost 870 transportation professionals, including engineers, equipment operators, managers, and technicians, work in the Salem District to provide residents, commuters, and visitors with roads they can count on. The transportation professionals who live and work in VDOT's Salem District are truly committed to providing transportation excellence to the citizens of the Commonwealth. Right. Well, that video hopefully provided a real quick overview of both the beautiful region we serve and the activities that, uh, that VDOT employees are doing to, to support that. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't say thank you to this board for the support that you provide to the communities here in Southwest Virginia. We'll have a project tour this afternoon, about two hours, uh, right here in the Roanoke Valley. So we will not be going in some of the surrounding areas. A couple notable projects that you've supported, US 220 and Botetot. Uh, $81 million project for about nine miles that will uh, improve. It was, it was desired to be a four-lane roadway, so it'll be an improved two-lane roadway with a two-foot separation. We think will really make a difference in runoff road crashes and uh, head-on collisions on that corridor. Southgate Interchange, any of the tech fans that go to the football game will be using that interchange at some point in the future. $47 million project scheduled for the fall of 18, but we've got a significant incentives for an early completion, and we'll see how the contractor uh, Branch Highways does on that project. Project. US 58 continues to be a corridor that's on the south side to support economic development and connect the port to I-77. Uh, recently completed a $120 million project of 8.2 miles. 19 miles remain to make that connection between the port and Interstate 77 corridor. And lastly, Ms. Valentine, the 460S curves that connect Roanoke and Lynchburg uh, is a project that we've had a lot of accidents with and, and recently just under $19 million in the first round of smart scale is a project under preliminary engineering. So, You'll see some of the activities in the Roanoke Valley, but certainly VDOT and your support is throughout the district. And, and with that, I just want to say thank you for your support. Look forward to spending some time with you on the tour. I think we will have sunshine, maybe a little bit warm. If there's anything that I can do to make your stay in Roanoke more pleasant, please let me know. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Hey, Mr. King, we had the pleasure yesterday of flying out here, and uh, we were in a relatively small plane. We went over the S-curves. In fact, we saw the beautiful mountains. We were flying at 4,500 feet, and I asked the pilot, how high is that mountain over there? He said 4,600 feet. Yeah. <laughs> I said, do I need to get a concern? <laughs> he said, no, we'll fly around it. But um, it really was uh, interesting to see uh, some of the projects you'll see this afternoon. Um, before we move on, I thought it would be an uh, opportunity, uh, the district uh, member here, Mr. Fallon, any comments you'd like to have to start with? Or? Well, sure. 
if you give me the floor. I, I, the only comment I have, that was a great video. I enjoyed it, Ken. I can't, I, 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 how long did you have to go out on 81 to you actually saw the traffic flowing to get that video, though? Curious. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Rosen, you're a large member here. Any comments, sir? It's hard, always hard to follow, Mr. Fraley. No, just yeah. like to welcome everyone here. Uh, I know we'll be having dinner downtown. Uh, many of you uh, who I've been colleagues with for a while have been to Roanoke in the past, you know, 10 years ago and five years ago, and I think you'll see a significant difference in the community. The downtown Roanoke is very lively, and the surrounding area as well, all the counties around going south and west and north. Uh, there's a lot going on in the area. Amtrak, uh, which thank you to DRPT for helping get Amtrak here. That's going to make a big difference for our community, um, and I hope you enjoy your stay here. All right, well, thank you. I should also mention too, Mr. Stenson was going to be—he's going to be here, but a little bit late. Um, so Jerry will be joining us here, uh, hopefully in the next hour or so. All right, what we're going to do now—we'll start our workshop. But the first presentation is we have talked about um, the board and maybe it's changing responsibilities and the type of information that you need to have to make good decisions. In fact, we were having dinner last evening, speaking about this. We're going to have a retreat. Uh, in August uh, and uh, we'll have a facilitator uh, we'll be reaching out to you to get some of the comments you may want to have it discussed um, but also uh, we'll be working through some things uh, because the next six or seven months is while we're here really want to make sure this uh, continuity and you're comfortable with uh, uh, things going forward uh, regardless of who the new administration uh, might be um, spoke with the governor this past week. Um, he obviously under, he, he recognizes and, and congratulates the things are going pretty good in transportation. Not that they're perfect. We got a lot of things, but they're going. A lot of that has to do with the boards there, this board, the Port of Virginia board. Um, and so um, want to make sure that's what I'll be spending our spaceport board spending time really making sure that you guys uh, understand or at least what we were trying to do. Uh, and, and, and empowering you to be the, be the continuity for transportation here in the Commonwealth. So with that in mind, our first presentation really is sort of a, a, a primer to that. And uh, John Martin uh, is, uh, in fact, didn't you celebrate an anniversary this week? Didn't I see you in the paper, your, your business? I think we did. Uh, it's going to sort of share with us about uh, what's going on and how this all makes sense because at the end of the day, that's really why we're doing this. We get sometimes tied in technical, but what we're really trying to do is make people's lives better, is connect them, uh, better economy. And John's going to share a little bit of what his thoughts about what's going on. So, John, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and members of the board. It's an honor to be here and to share work that we've done over the last 18 months about placemaking and transportation and how it relates to economic development. So it all really matters in the end. I stood here, not literally at this podium, but in Richmond 18 months ago and stood before you and pointed to what we thought was a new future, a new future for economic development and for the Commonwealth. And what I talked about were that in the future, there are gonna be cities that are gonna be classified as winners or losers. And they're also gonna be smaller towns that are gonna have that same distinction, either a winner or a loser. And it gets back to some fundamental demographic calculus. We are going through a profound age shift. Ever since the dawn of man, we've always had more younger people alive than older people. But that's changing now because of the birth rate has shifted dramatically. It used to be four kids per family. That's why there's so many boomers. And now they're just two kids, 2.1 per family. And then the longevity revolution. We're living an extra 30 years because of all the great work from our healthcare institutions. Uh, and that's a, that's a big bonus. But what those two things are doing are conspiring to change this population pyramid. And I want you just to look at Virginia data, men on the left, women on the right, the population pyramid in 1990. And let's just go forward to 2000, 2010, out into the future at 2020 and then 2030. And you can see right before your eyes this fundamental shift. And look at the comparison over these 40 years. We're shifting shape from a population pyramid to a population rectangle. And so you've got to start to think about the future where there's going to be just as many 18 and under people as there are going to be over 65 people. 
So it's just a different, different equation that we've never had before. Uh, and it's a worldwide phenomenon, but it's happening across the country and certainly happening here in Virginia. Well, it has profound implications for a lot of things. One in particular is what's going to happen to our labor force. This is taking the Bureau of Labor Statistics and analyzing the future workforce is going to grow in America by 5%. But look at those age bands. It's the older worker group that's going to grow the most, about 20%. The 55 plus. The sweet spot, 25 to 54, is really going to have marginal growth, 3.9%. But look at the younger group, the 16 to 24, there's a projected decrease in the number of workers there. And we could drill down and look at data for Hampton Roads and show you the exact numbers that the census are projecting, actually a fall off in younger people. And so if you look at my elbows, this is a visual aid technique here, look at my population triangle, my population pyramid, and let's shift shape and watch my elbows. So we're going to have relatively fewer younger people and relatively more older people. And so this labor force thing presents a problem or potentially an opportunity for people like the folks in this room, because there is already started a battle for younger workers to try to be first in on younger workers. And we developed three or four tenets of belief about this. And it gets back to placemaking, creating a great place that attracts people, and then employers will follow. We think that's a fundamental shift in the economic development model. The old model is you go after Fortune 500 whales. There are 500 of them. And you try to get them to come to your market. And you might get lucky and get one or two. And then people follow. And then a great place gets built. And the community grows. The new model is to target key industries that have demonstrated some success in, in what you offer as a community, but at the same time invest an equal amount of intellectual and financial resources into building a great place. And then people will come to that place and then employers will seek out where there's preponderance of, of workers, of potential workers for them already in place and your community grows. And so this is a, a shift that's taken place and we are seeing evidence that it really is happening. It's about intentionally creating a remarkable or great place. And I want to wax a little bit philosophical here because this didn't uh, arrive from, from SIR. This was a, a theory or a practice that started decades ago. And one of the founders of placemaking is William White. He's the author of this book that came out in 75, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. And he just noticed all the different things that were happening in high density areas and all of the human interchange. And he started to study it and realize a lot of this is just not accidental. A lot of this by creating a certain space builds in human contact, it builds in exchange, it builds in creativity. And the model that was created from that book uh, turned into a company, the Project for Public Spaces, and they've helped really thousands of, of locations all around the world. But they fundamentally have a, a formula of four pillars that create the science of placemaking. It's sociability, uh, user and activities, comfort and image, and access and linkages. And that's what's really apropos to this body, thinking about that access and linkages, the proximity, being connected, walkable, convenient, accessible. And so these are all deliberate things that, that now advanced civilizations, advanced cities are, are purposely, intentionally trying to orchestrate to really build a great place. One other point that they make that I think is really powerful is their theory of the power of 10. And the idea is this, that if you go to any really successful place, it really is part of a bigger ecosystem. It really is part of a, a city and region with activity centers, at least 10 activity centers. And then from there, inside each activity center, there are about 10 places. And then if you go and you pull back the, the layer and you look into those activity centers in those 10 places, you'll see at least 10 activities. So it's oftentimes more, but this is the formula that really creates the, the, the juice, the buzz, the, the interaction that makes a place a great place. The third tenet is that transportation, infrastructure, and services are really part of successful placemaking. You can be real intentional in support uh, alternatives to, to drive alone and all kind of um, resources that the infrastructure that citizens want. We do a lot of research on millennials and we study millennials in different jurisdictions. I think we've done about 15 cities now. And we look across 
the list of attributes that they want, and it doesn't change very much by city. The only change we've really seen is people in Colorado want mountains. Everybody else wants to be closer to the water. But when you look at this, and you see the top of the list is the basic attributes. We call these, you know, kind of soap gets you clean. You gotta do these. You gotta be safe, you gotta have affordable housing and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, quality job opportunities. But just underneath this are placemaking attributes. And these are the attributes that millennials are telling us they really want in a place. And some of these are cultural attributes, but some of them are infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, like being bikeable and walkable, easy public transportation. And I want to make a point that also millennials we're seeing more and more want to be in more of an urban feeling location. And that's something they tell us in the research. So we shared a lot of this with you 18 months ago. And uh, Deputy Secretary Donahue said, I want you guys to go out and conduct research and test these assertions <laughs> and inform VTrans 2040. I want you to go and validate, test, and really put through uh, the rigor of research these theories and come back and, and to the extent you can try to find data from Virginia, but also original data in talking to site selection consultants and real estate uh, professionals, executives at, at companies across America, and really come back to us with the latest research. So we did that. We went out and got input. We scanned a lot of existing research on placemaking. Uh, we interviewed the top U.S. site selection consultants, and I talked to a few friends of mine that have been in the business all their lives, and and they shared with me their hit list of the top consultants in the business, the top consultants that we called and interviewed at length, one-on-one. -on -one. And then we talked to corporate real estate executives uh, through a national survey. And then we got into looking at what are people looking for in a location, people that had just moved or people that are planned to move. And both of those groups, we found them through a national survey. And so all of this data and our insights and findings are in our summer report. And I believe you have a copy of that um, and then that is a real detailed body of work that goes into um, all of the things I'm sharing with you today. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to give you the five major highlights of that report, five major insights that I think um, really point us to this new economic development model and a great potential for Virginia in our future. The first one is today and for the foreseeable future, expanding and relocating companies those companies are chasing available talent, available workforce talent. It really is coming down to workforce, workforce, workforce. In our interviews with site selection consultants, we heard these sort of, uh, these sort of inputs. Most site selection today is really it's about site elimination. You need to have the products to offer, then talk workforce development and business climate. Location decisions today start and end with, do they have the people we want? Do they have the people we want? And the pipeline of workers is really important. They really want to know the workers are in place, but they want to know that the city or the community or the town's investing in placemaking, that more people are going to come. And so the statistic that we heard uh, from a number of interviewees said they want to know that 85% of the workers are going to be there if they show up with a, with a new company or if they're going to expand a location. So you got to get them there. And that's what placemaking is about, attracting them. We went on and did a survey on real estate uh, uh, professionals in, in uh, executive positions and companies. And one question we asked just validated that qualitative research. What's one issue, the one issue is your greatest concern about location uh, in, in workforce coming right to the top. Location, the big concern in terms of thinking about a new headquarters or a new manufacturing center or a data center. And then right behind it is workforce. So this is asking your single biggest concern and seeing those two at the top of the list, leading the rest. And then we gave them a choice on a one to five scale. We asked, uh, think about the importance of these different attributes that we listed, as you see on the left-hand side. How important are these? And we show, we're sharing with you the top two box scores on each one. So you can see right at the top, the fours and fives leading the way, the availability of a region's labor force to meet our needs today and the availability of a region's labor force to meet our needs in the future. Two top concerns. I also want to draw your attention to the next two, the connectivity of the second tier. You see the quality of the overall transportation system uh, is very important and is at the, at the top of this list. Having workers already present with skills they need is the most important workforce development issue. 
All of these questions centered around workforce development and how uh, a jurisdiction could help a, a, a business. And you can see at the top of the list, having that workforce already present with the skills we need or having the training there to, to really turn the workers into the force that we need. I could go on and on about this, but I think the best thing is just a few quick examples. Um, there was a highly touted move by Owens and Miner recently to move to downtown Richmond. And the CEO, when he announced this, he said, we're doing this because we need to get more millennials. We need to get a greater share of that, that workforce. You don't have to go very far to find these examples. One more, uh, which I think is probably the biggest one from last year's ADP. ADP brought 2,000 jobs to downtown Norfolk. And when you look at all the articles and you talk to the executives behind that, uh, there's just quote after quote and, and reference after reference about the ability to attract a diverse workforce. That's what they're all about. So being in an, in an activity center uh, and, and really leveraging a lot of the work that downtown Norfolk uh, has done in placemaking and making downtown a hot spot. Well, I could go on and on, but there are reports out there that have done a good job of just recapping the latest moves. Uh, in the last 500 corporate moves in this report by Smart Growth America, it's all about talent recruitment and retention. So we feel like uh, we have tested that point and everywhere we turn, including interviews and surveys, that there's no question. It's workforce, workforce, workforce. And it's not only today, and I really have to make this point, it's about the future. So in the, our surveys, we also asked uh, the site, site selection consultants, but we, and, and also the, the folks in the workforce that are managing large real estate projects, and they said it's the, the ability to meet our needs in the future. And it, it's because these guys running companies are seeing this kind of demographic data. They understand how important this is uh, to the sustainability of their company. All right, number two, every community type, rural, suburban, and urban, has a unique appeal and market. And this is something that is so important to dispel this myth that everybody's moving to downtowns. That's just not true. And if you look at, through our national survey of movers, and look at the people that are rural movers, about 19% or, or have recently moved uh, from the rural areas, you got 47% that have moved from a city sort of location, a city with mixed office space or mostly residential, and then the <coughs> suburban movers, about a third there. And so if you look at where they moved, this is where they're coming from, they're moving to pretty much the same sort of mix. The suburban takes a little bit of a hit, but we're seeing those people that have just moved over 100 miles or more across the country, they're moving from the small rural areas to other small rural areas, or they're moving from suburban areas to other suburban areas. So it's really about activity centers. It's not about just the big super downtowns. So this is great news when you think about small towns across Virginia and, and uh, in counties across Virginia. The same thing with future movers. When we ask people, you're planning to move in the future? more than 100 miles across the country, and we say, where are they from right now? And then where do they want to move to? It's that same sort of split. The, the suburban areas take just a little bit of a hit, but not a huge one. So I think that's great news for those forward-thinking uh, smaller jurisdictions that can really invest in placemaking uh, and be really attractive for those movers that want to go from a small area to another small area. Number three, people move for both rational and emotional reasons. So about 15% of us are moving at any time in America, but I want you to think about your last move. It wasn't all about, I wanna be next to that development, or I wanna be next to that retailer, uh, or next to that school. There's some emotional elements that go on. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't share these with you because creating, creating a great public place, doing placemaking is more of an art than a science. Certainly there is the science of transportation infrastructure, but it's also an art of building sort of culture in, in, in aligning your DNA of a city or a place to that of those people you're trying to attract. So we see this in, in a lot of the research we do, and we saw it come out of the study that we did of the movers and, and recent movers and future movers, the idea of rational and emotional considerations. And we asked a whole series of factors, and we were so surprised at how high the emotional factors scored. And at the top of the list was about, I feel comfortable 
in my community, the emotional factors of what people are looking for when they move. The same thing for uh, future movers. Right at the top of the list is I feel like it's home. And where this is coming from is that there is a deep-seated drive for people to feel like they belong and to be affirmed in communities that they move to. So they're trying to align where they're moving to, to how they see themselves. And they want that affirmation. They also are concerned about being left behind. And so this idea about being belong is really powerful and we're seeing this as, a, as emotional factors. You want people to say, yes, I feel at home there. One of the things that we've seen in our research over the years is the idea of millennials really wanting a diverse community. And they really come by it quite naturally. I mean, when I was born as a baby boomer, eight out of 10 of my cohorts at school were Caucasian. And now millennials, it's six out of 10. And so when they look around, they see a diverse world and an inclusive world. And so when we think about the future of places and cities, we think that the winning places of tomorrow are gonna be places that are for every race, every person, every mindset, every gender. And we see us shifting from somewhat of a sort of a melting pot to uh, a bento box, if you will. And if you think about a bento box, there are all these little compartments and, and you can be comfortable there, but you still wanna belong. You still wanna be part of something bigger. And so we think winning places of the future are gonna be about being a big tents. And that's part of placemaking, to really be a place that everybody can belong and become. All right, number four, the ideal neighborhood for all three location types is the 15-minute livable community. And this is kind of a new phenomena that's happening uh, and is really, I think, catching on in, in some of the um, place design camps. Right now, if you look at community A versus community B, and through research, ask people, what do you prefer? Community A is houses with large yards and you have to drive to the places you need to go. Community B, on the other hand, is houses with small yards and it's easy to walk to the places you need to go. And you can see America's sort of split between those two. But this is the most fascinating thing. This has shifted over time. So when you look at these scores from community A to community B, you see this decided shift that the community A concept is becoming less and less appealing since 2004 and the community B, the small yards and easy to walk to places you need to go, is gaining traction. And so it is just, and actually in 2015, uh, you see community B is outpacing that community A. So it's just fascinating to understand over time. Now, you could argue the chicken and the egg. Is this the housing stock and the way we live then? Or uh, is this something fundamental that's gone on inside of our core needs? But regardless of what the answer is, we're seeing, the, we're seeing this decided shift. So the desire, and this is an important point, subtle point on this, it's not that the suburbs are losing out, it's the traditional suburbs, right? It's the cul-de-sac bedroom communities that we're seeing falling out of favor. And so in this chart, you can see the suburbs where, where most people drive to most places versus a suburb with walkable amenities. And you can see the people that live there now and say they want to live there someday in the future and the change. And so you can see that the change is shifting over to the suburb with walkable amenities. And then another twist on this is some great research the Transit Center put out. And this is looking at what is your ideal community? What, what do you aspire to? And then what's your, what's your current community? And so what we're seeing here is really a lot of validation from this, from this body of work. The idea of a mixed offices, apartments, and shops, uh, even, even in uh, urban downtown areas, or the idea of a or suburban neighborhood with a mix of houses, shops, and businesses, or a small town with a mix of houses, shops, and businesses, that ideal is larger than where people are currently residing. And so this is the promise for the future, that we see this sort of pent-up demand, if you will, moving to a more sophisticated view of the suburban lifestyle. And in our own OIPI research, we tested a lot of different concepts, and the idea of this 15-minute livable neighborhood just came out on top every time, that people really uh, want that convenience and want to be together and are looking for places that are organized to provide that. Number five, and my final point, uh, is that transportation and mobility options, especially for the younger cohorts, 
play an important role in creating a winning place. Uh, and, and we saw this in the research we conducted for OIPI and, and other, other studies that we got our hands on. For the recent movers, and this is showing all three generations for each one of these, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but it's the millennials on top of the red bar and then Gen Xers in gray and then the, the cream bar are boomers. So these are factors that, that recent movers say that they were uh, really interested in. Getting around using a car, yes, it is number one because we are a car-centric society. So you go beneath that one and you look at bikeable, walkable, or look at you can get around without a car, not car dependent, or availability of reliable public transportation. And you can see the younger generations are leading the way in those particular preferences. The same with future movers, the exact same pattern we see. Uh, and in particular, millennials really leading the way with, uh, you, they would like to get around without a car, be not in car dependent, if you will or availability of bike trails or reliable public transportation. So what we're seeing is that the movers prefer this less car-centric community. And where they're, either they're going to the suburbs or more rural communities or, or the bigger cities, uh, it really holds up that they really would prefer communities to be less car-centric. And it goes across all the different dimensions, sidewalks being within a short commute, easy access to highway, all these different dimensions you can see there really is this generational bent that the younger generations have this new sort of uh, ethos and expectation. And I'll, with millennials in particular, we saw them really talking about this idea of car-free living. And so we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, and I tell you, I'm seeing it just around my little building in the fan district. About half my workforce walks to work. Uh, and I don't know what they do after work. I don't want to know. So I want to leave you with this last thought, because this was an aha moment in research. When we really get into the data, sometimes we can uh, tease out some, some real significant things. And, and this happened in this case. We were looking through the corporate real estate professional data and trying to understand who, who appreciates placemaking and what that can do for a site uh, potential. And so what we found is that the real estate professionals who really understood placemaking and really could talk about it, that those guys, they seem to have a greater connection to placemaking and transportation as a component of placemaking and the advantages that placemaking delivers to a community. So in talking to them, we asked the question, well, have you ever heard of placemaking? Now, that's getting to be more of a mainstream term, but, but it's, it's still technical. And so 21% of these site selection real estate executives said, yeah, I've heard of that. So small minority, but we started to look at that group versus the, the, the others, and we started to see these big differences. The more familiar respondents with placemaking said they had significantly higher feeling that placemaking is important because it attracts younger workers, that placemaking is important because it attracts the type of labor force we need. The availability of bikeable and walkable locations plays an interesting part in placemaking. And, even highway accessibility is an important part of placemaking. So, so they just got it, these executives over the ones that didn't understand placemaking as much. Uh, and they also understood the role of transportation in placemaking. So you can see from this chart on all these transportation factors, those guys in the, in the, in the red bar much more uh, assured that these transportation attributes and initiatives really are tied back to placemaking and help with placemaking. So, it really leads us to appreciate the fact that the more and more that, that we can work on placemaking, the more and more that we can get um, more executives to understand that Virginia does this, the better off we're gonna be. We, we looked at what that group of that 21% of those real estate executives that really understood placemaking, we said, who are those guys? And we really looked at them and we put the data into three buckets. Um, knowledge workers, the people that were in companies that, own, that managed knowledge workers, people uh, that were managing companies of, uh, I would call it sort of transportation supply chain management. And then the third area was um, retail and sort of services. So these three groups and the folks that really understood placemaking from this corporate advantage and saw transportation playing a big role were the folks in the knowledge worker space, the higher income jobs, something that I think Virginia wants. So what's the next step? Well, 
I think there are just a couple of things that we need to do to keep this momentum going. And our report concludes with these ideas to, to really keep studying these younger generations. There's a lot of talk about millennials. Well, there's another generation right behind them, the Gen Zs, who are three to 15 years old. They're gonna be in the workforce pretty soon. So we've gotta keep studying them and understand their preferences for place and keep investing in placemaking. Don't ignore the basics. We gotta, we gotta do the basics in terms of access, mobility, safety, but think about all these other things that we could do uh, in, in really cultivating a sense of place. And, and be specific. I think different locations have different assets and that's unique to those locations. You can't bypass those, but then you gotta quickly go to all these other attributes that, that people are looking for in place and talk about the emotional benefits that we're here as a community for everybody. We're a big tent and make your locality more bikeable and more walkable uh, and, and share this message. Share this message on the CTB website where we were really pleased to be able to help in, in bringing that to life, but through your personal bios, try to build in more narrative about this and share it with all the communities that you guys serve uh, to get this message out there. And then lastly, get the full report. I've just given you some quick highlights this morning, but it goes into great detail and, and share that report with everybody. And uh, I think we'll, we'll take a, a, continue to take big steps in moving the Commonwealth forward. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, Ms. Bellheim. Thank you very much. I'm always fascinated. Every time you know you spoke in here and you actually came to Lynchburg at one point and spoke with us, um, we just completed in Lynchburg um, a few months ago a connectivity study focusing on transportation and tying it to economic development. It covered everything from rail, air, highways, bottlenecks, and placemaking. Um, actually being the very first one. And it's housed, the responsibilities for it are actually housed in the Office of um, Economic Development. And the Office of Economic Development is working with the local government councils in Appomattox, Farmville, different places. <laughs> because as you're speaking, I know you're thinking, oh, you don't have to be in Washington to do this. Smaller areas, and we think of our smaller areas as towns. So it's, so it's actually building that um, kind of community, that home place. That's exactly right. And everybody is in economic development when it comes to placemaking. Yes, everybody yes. has a role to play. And so, to get that message across Virginia is, would be excellent. So I do have a summary, which okay. I will share with you in a okay. full report. But have you made this presentation to go, Virginia? I have not. Because I also see that tie-in with Go Virginia as you know, we're trying to look at expanding the Virginia economy. How do we do it? Because the model of businesses coming and the workforce following is flipping. So we need the workforce in order to get the businesses to come and expand. You throw in distributed workforce in the future and, and more the, you know, the DRPT study on the incredible growth of telework I mean, it's really, um, people are going to find a place <laughs> and live there and then work anywhere. One of the things that, I'm sorry, want to keep, uh, might be helpful um, is what are the barriers to this being successful? And I can tell you where I've seen it, a big one is our independent city concept in Virginia, the bureaucracy, particularly uh, for me from Hampton Roads, um, regions, uh, and this whole idea of placemaking um, the political structure uh, is not set up to be conducive to it. Now, you know, you, I have noticed obviously in this district, and I've said it many times, you guys have seen to say, okay, we're, we're going to work together, but that is a very big issue across our Commonwealth because of our independent city. Now, we're not going to change that. But I think it might be useful, um, uh, maybe another report is, what do you see as the barriers uh, to this, I uh, mean, you know, pushing back against it, uh, and we fight against ourselves, and that, and that's uh, uh, Miss Brown. Miss Brown, questions that you talk about the change from the triangle to more of the rectangle, and the I guess move to reurbanization as opposed to sub suburbanization. Could it be? Is that being driven by the millennials or by the boomers who are actually looking to downsize, empty nesters, moving back to an urban environment? where they don't have to then maintain the large properties, drive, they want the convenience. Uh, 
I mean, what, what's your insights? It, right. Both both age cohorts are are driving that, but it's but it's, again, it's really not just the downtowns, but they're being driven by different reasons. And I, I shared a little bit of this with you 18 months ago. The, the boomers really are trying to maintain their vitality. You know, they really want to not go off to the retirement community, and to really live in a a 15 minute convenient place that just has one car for them, <laughs> not not one for every every person in, in the household. And then the, the millennials are driven by this whole need to be hyper-connected and hyper-wired. It's this collective self that they, they got wired by technology and by their parents uh, working with them on every single project possible. And so just putting them together and created a new sense of self. And we, we talk about that sense of self being community-focused, that they, they really are hyper-community. And so they're trying to live in these more denser areas. So when you, when you describe the new suburbanization, and I keep thinking about communities like Short Pump and, right. and, and uh, you know, Western Henrico, where they are essentially building townships and a larger suburban community. So they're, it's still suburban, but it's, it mimics very closely the 15 minute. That's right. That's right. And so do you see that? As I, think we're, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think more and more developers get this. And also the, the unfortunate consequence of the Great Recession on millennials, and they're not buying houses at the same rate as the Gen Xers did. And so I think that um, developers and builders are rethinking the size of house and the size of lot. And I know communities are thinking this way too. How do we, how do we continue to push towards this greater density? to really be attractive. And I think the other gating factor, honestly, is, is our public education system. So those communities that have that figured out as well are gonna have a decided advantage. Mr. But I think, I think you're right, I think we should, should try to inventory those challenges uh, and opportunities to advance this. Hello. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick observation and then I wanna, I wanna ask a, a specific question, but you know, when we go to Mill Mountain this afternoon and look at the overlook, you're going to be able to look down into the valley and you're going to see the subdivisions that were developed in the 20s. And they are all grids. They're blocks. And then if you look in the distance, you'll be able to see Roanoke County, which was developed from the 50s to the 80s, and you'll see cul-de-sacs. So in the, in, to, to, the, to the chairman's point, in, in Virginia, a lot of the, the traditional sort of independent cities um, are older and were developed in that. And you also will see different neighborhoods. You'll see a Grand and Court area that's got its own movie theater and little drugstore and restaurants. And you'll see sort of the South Roanoke area that's got a, its own little set of restaurants. And so, um, and there's other communities uh, in, in Roanoke, Highland Park, there's different, different communities that are like that. So I think, I think this makes sense. My specific question is, so what? What's that mean for statewide transportation policy? Should we stop authorizing cul-de-sacs? Should we stop? I mean, what, what, this is all great. What's it mean? I think there's one silver bullet, but I do think that policy uh, creates guardrails and direction. And so I would, I would encourage you to start thinking that way. How do, we, how do we set up, how do we first educate everybody about this sort of data and trend uh, and get people to understand the shifting economic development model, but then to think about how do we influence the direction of, of communities and how they're built. I think it's, it, it's what we have to do to stay, um, uh, to, to maintain Virginia's advantages that we've had for 400 years. This is, this is moving forward. We've got we to do these things. So I would I, I get agree it, but with I, I guess the, the, the retreat this summer is going to be more about, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it, to me, we've, we've heard all items, these statistics yeah. are interesting and they're good, and, they're, and I get it, and they're important to be able to make policy, but if they don't translate into policy, it doesn't make any difference. I think that's the next thing we're going to start talking about that. The next thing on the agenda is, is these are really by the first two. The first one is you need input. Second one is how do you translate that into actionable items in, in that regard uh, in terms of policy. So I agree. Uh, yes, Mr. Kilpatrick. To Mr. Fraylin's point regarding how a development occurs, 
Um, and I've lived in land development now for a little over 30 years. I mean, that's where I started my career and continue it to even to this day. The challenge of, of uh, I'll call it neighborhood or subdivision development, is one that um, you know, we see all over the state where uh, people, um, there's a tendency to, to want, uh, they, there's a sense of security in neighborhoods that have limited ways in and out. Even down to the local sheriff and police level, you'll hear the stories of single access points. If a bad guy gets in, it's harder for them to get out. And so there's this, this whether that's, that, that's uh, correct or not, or, or, or based on facts, there's a lot of that. There's also the, the, um, uh, uh, the feeling that people that drive by your house are speeding. And, and the, just fundamentally, the, the, the world of, of cul-de-sacs grows up in kind of these, these sort of basic, these basic areas. And then there's the strain of, of local government and uh, local approvals, boards of supervisors typically, with uh, transportation planning. Both Nick and I have been involved in some of the discussions about connectivity. And connectivity many times boils down to we don't want that neighborhood connected to our neighborhood. And, and, it, and land development and land use is a local decision in Virginia by, that's how, how the, the codes are established. And it creates a, a significant strain down, down at that local level. And, and I think it's important to remember on our system of 50, call it 58,000 miles of road, 48,000 are secondary. And then another uh, approximately 10,000 miles are on the urban system. So, uh, you know, you think about the, the bulk of what we operate here in Virginia, again, 48,000 miles of it are secondary roads, which are everything from a cul-de-sac to a dirt road to Braddock Road. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I, I, just, I think uh, Charlie makes really good points. I, I, I threw the cul-de-sac out there as a point on purpose. To, I mean, that's not saying that's, that's the, the end-all, be-all. Oh, that's a controversial issue. That's one of a myriad of issues that, that if you're going to translate this into policy, you're going to have to address things like that. And the reality is every one of those county roads is accepted in the VDOT system or not. Now, the city's different. But but in the county, we, in the counties in Virginia, we do have a lot of say over what that looks like, even though we don't have the land use planning power. And and um, part of that is policy. Part of it's actual execution uh, when that and like, for instance, I mean, we can certainly bring some concepts back uh, as to how they interplay. But we just won an award by the uh, American Planning Association. Um, uh, about how we go about this. May, we need to share more with you how that's action. I'm not saying that all awards are good or bad. I'm just saying that, uh, I mean, because I, I, I recognize we were getting a lot of awards for P3s too, and, and we had to reform <laughs> the whole process. So uh, I, I understand that. There's, but, uh, there's yeah. probably an award for the, <laughs> that's exactly for right. the tallest midget. But. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the, the effect is, is that, you know, there are... That's where you know we have to say what are the policies and how are they executed to actually move them. And I could not agree. we'll bring some concepts back. The next uh, next on there, Mr. Connors. Thank you, John. I'm I'm also jazzed about every, your presentations, and I really appreciate it. This is why I get excited about innovation and our little subcommittee and, and the new role that Rob Carey is playing because I think that this is going to connecting these dots and realizing everything is connected. Uh, gives us an opportunity to not only innovate. Innovation to me is not only chasing the shiny lures of the, the new technologies, but, but it's about creatively thinking about ways to solve these problems so that, so that we do create a sense of place and we are involved in placemaking and, and economic development opportunities going forward. So thank you. Thank you. And then we probably need to bring this to a, a head here because we <laughs> got a bill up. Yeah. Mr. Phelan's provocative question. It, 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 we've seen studies over the years that, uh, you know, if you build the transit infrastructure, then the developers and real estate community will typically co-op that and build around that. And that's typically how you have seen denser development occur. Are we seeing those same trends? Is that still true, that, that, that developers will follow the transit infrastructure to build these places, or is it the case that they're building places and, and this? Well, I, would, we, I wouldn't say co-opted. That's why we do it. Transit I mean, that's exactly why we do is it. A, yeah. is a <laughs> successful model yeah. in, in city after city. And I think you'll watch the next, uh, the next one play out on Broad Street. 
I got the biggest kick uh, that people say, we don't build roads for economic, we don't, we don't put in uh, infrastructure, you know, light rail is going to be nothing but a big economic development boon. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's why we build roads. Every road we ever, I mean, it's just, I, I find that, Mr. Brown, I, you're, you're right, that's great. I mean, I find it, it, you know, the same people who were against the light rail were screaming we had to have a road because of economic development. I mean, so it, it's really uh, interesting how that and works. Mr. Out. Chairman, if I might add to, to Mr. Brown, I think he makes a good point. Yeah. I think we've done a very poor job in land use planning of capturing the increased value that, trans, that transit can give to land values. And, and I think there's something there, there one day. Possibly, but there might be the same there for roads too. Could be. Yeah, in other words, uh, in there. So that's all about, and that's one of the things we're gonna be this afternoon uh, testifying about, um, is what are the, the sources and that's right, you're going who to should Washington. pay. Yeah, who should pay, yeah, and who should pay. Um, and uh, it, it really gets down to how big a group should the infrastructure be spread over for the payments? It all starts with a it's very simple a user fee, right? There's people who use it, pay for it, all the way over to using sales taxes because every good and service we use goes over it. And that's really what the, the, the uh, you know, where you fall sometimes politically and where you see that all going. And I, my premise is there's no really one right answer. We're probably going to need to use all that depending on the circumstances. But you're exactly right, and, and uh, cities tend to have done a little better job because of proffers, but then you saw our General Assembly push back this year and say you're going too far in the proffers. So it's, uh, it's an inter you're, you're right, it's an interesting conversation. It's, it's an uh, infrastructure, how is it paid for, and over whom should you distribute uh, that to be paid for? I mean, you can always say, we're to have that debate in health insurance now too. You know, our older, the elderly, just back to your point, you know, about as the aging population, you got the pushback, well, why are we paying for people to have babies? <laughs> and then, the, and then the, the younger people are saying, well, why are we paying for people that are, are sicker? I mean, that's the, that's, I mean, it's sort of the similar thing here in transportation. I mean, obviously not. One's really life and death, maybe in some, quite frankly, thankfully, most of our decisions are not. Uh, but the point is, that's really, as we, uh, you know, that's the concepts of, of where does the policy, who should be, who are the real benefactors, and how should that be spread, the benefits and the cost of those benefits, that stuff. So, yes. Just a yes. quick comment on the, um, placemaking. In Charlottesville, with the Hydraulic 29 study, it, you know, this is really going on. We're looking at placemaking and land use planning before the transportation piece is, you know, considered. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's we, we keep referring back to the the book the big roads that many of us have read I mean we all forget that when we first planned this highway system it was all gonna be toll roads that's what the original concept was so this conversation has been going on ever since I guess the first guy dropped the tree down to make a road Charlie you know to you know who's going who, who's who's getting benefit from it so Okay, well, thank Great. you very much, Mr. Martin. Thank you, John, for being here. Very interesting. It's always a lively discussion. Um, the next topic is going to be sort of is related to this because back to Mr. Fillon's point, we're going to talk a little bit about how do we take all this and develop policies and specifically and where does that, you know, where do our responsibilities come and go? I wanted to mention one other thing that um, uh, as we move forward here, this was the first time we had um, Mr. Uh, Whitworth and I invited Mr. Uh, Garzinski as the vice chairman, but since he is not available, Mr. Whitworth, as the secretary did, was involved in developing the, the um, agenda for these meetings. I think that's another thing this board needs to take over, have input into that. Um, and so what we'll do in the future, it'll be primarily the vice chairman will be setting in and developing the agenda. Uh, if he's not available, then the secretary, we can't have because we have, I'm on the board, and those two <laughs> on there at the same time, that does substitute, it's a public meeting, Mr. Uh, Walton was quickly to point out, but wanted to point out the board should have input into how we develop these agendas uh, in that. So we're beginning that process, and um, uh, with that, we'll turn this over to Mr. Moore. This is something we've been talking about a while, and that is uh, these issues uh, regarding um, the uh, arterial preservation, and 
So, Mr. Uh, Moore, good morning and good and to Mr. see Mr. Chairman you. and uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen of the board, uh, this is really a report out of the committee that uh, we put together on corridor preservation with Ms. Hines and, and Mr. Frayling and those actions that we have taken so far uh, within the engineering director. It doesn't require uh, board action and it kind of ties into some, some other things. Um, and what we've done is focused on segments of arterials along the corridors of statewide significance. The state, as you know, the corridors of statewide significance were selected by the board and uh, will again be reviewed in the, the VTRANS that's coming up. That's it? Sorry. Great, there we go. So what was the problem? And, and so we're defining that first and then kind of the goal and then, then the solution. And, and the, the issue is we've put roads out, as, as the chairman has said, for economic development, for mobility, for those sorts of things to make life better. But when we do that, economic development comes, and sometimes signalization and other actions taken destroy or, or reduce that mobility that was originally there. So how do you uh, get those two things together so that you're continuing with economic development, you're keeping your... Uh, your, your investment that the Commonwealth has made, and how do we do that in a way that, that then further occur, encourages economic development? Uh, and, and the first goal is up there of what we decided to do, and that's discourage signal and access point, and that was brought up by proliferation by Mr. Fralin, and also uh, to continue to support economic development. So that, that's the problem and that's the goals. Uh, New signals have been and, and still are in some cases de de for developments are approved at the local level, but collectively have a statewide implications. We needed to balance the need for throughput versus the need to accommodate side street use and pedestrians for mobility and, and economic development. The photo on the left shows a recently installed signal that interrupts what used to be a long stretch of road with no signals. The photo on the right is an example of an older corridor where multiple signals and poor access management have evolved over time. So what I'm focusing on today is what we have done in the design, I'll call both process and standards to see what we can do within the engineering directorate. That will tie into some segments that are behind you that uh, Mr. Donahue will be working with VTRANS are references in the design standard that are being incorporated refer to those corridors of statewide significance. They're unique to that, so that's the next, the next thing to follow. And those are also draft, because that will be future discussion with VTRANS and developed, and again, with, uh, uh, with Mr. Donahue. Uh, identifying uh, critical conditions. There were two things that we focused on. One was, we called it mobility preservation of highways. These are more of the rural places, the 460s, the 220s. And then the second is mobility enhancement. Now there is overlay of the type, type of treatment in those corridors, but the mobility enhancement is more urban arterial and the discussions that we had in that group were it's, it's not just a matter of not putting signals. In some of those cases, they're, they're already fully developed, but there are other issues there that we need to uh, realize and are very important. Those are things like access to adjacent parcels, transit, bike and ped, the complete or super street concepts that we see. These have actually been done uh, in an MOA between VDOT and Fairfax County in uh, um, uh, Tyson's Corner. Uh, that was predated and a lot of that drew on work that was done in Arlington County by Arlington County. So we actually have urban standards that we are developing and, and are kind of hybrids for each unique location depending on the type of development that goes in there and that that work will continue uh, first thing that we did probably the biggest change is the level of authority for approval and these are these are not actually the standard itself but if a signal is to be put on on one of these draft segments it's going to require approval not at the district but at the central office. So new signals on a preservation segment, it goes to the state traffic engineer, and that means that it, it, it has, and it not just has to be uh, what we would call meet signal warrants, it has to be justified. So we are going to look for alternatives, and our design standards already call for that for uh, traffic circles or roundabouts, 
but we have also adding uh, uh, alternative intersection designs that now have to be looked at, including grade separation before a signal. And a signal is a last resort. And if we do put a signal in, then some of these designs will try to mitigate left turns, because that's what takes a lot of the time. The other thing, and this was brought up again by the committee, signal removals, we now have a process going in to do that, and that's something that we can do. We've done it before, but now in our design process, there's a process to actually remove signals that is being incorporated into our design process and standards. The second issue down there for crossovers, uh, new crossovers or new median breaks on, on those corridors, uh, those segments of corridors of statewide significance, again, still in draft form, that also will have to be approved by the state location design engineer. Anything that doesn't meet standard already has to be approved at that level. And then crossover closings are approved at the district level. That's already done. And crossover closings are a good thing. So that's something we're going to continue to keep at that level. It makes it harder to put the things in that we don't want, keeps it easier to put the things in that we, that we do want. So that's something in process that, it, that is a big change. And that's something that Rosen, we can. We had a question. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. one of the signals of the four points where the district engineer, you know, who may have some more local knowledge is not. Uh, uh, let me clarify on that. The district, before it goes to the state lo location design engineer, the district engineer has to approve it and concur. We would never cut them out of the loop. It's just that it also has to go for that to, to, to does that answer the question? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You no, know, we are very, uh, much distributed authority and things, but for these selected things, we've brought a further approval back to the, back to the Commonwealth, yeah, or back to the Central League. Yeah. Very, very limited in what we've done. Does that answer the question? Yes, sir. Um, and then uh, the crossover closings we, we've talked about. The other things that we're, we're doing is uh, we, we've added to our design some alternative intersections. There's a lot of names for these, R cuts, um, quadrant roadway intersection. And I won't go through all of them. They're in your packet. There's a number of them. They, they tend to come under complete streets, but they, they, they are also things that deal with left turns and try to reduce left turns or move them so that they don't reduce the capacity of an intersection. You put a signal in, and immediately the rule of thumb is that it, it decreases the capacity by at least 50 percent. And if you, the more movements you have, you, you can sometimes reduce it down to 10 or 20 percent capacity of the, of the roadway. So we are also putting together a screening tool to assist in this and assist what applications might work at different locations. And that's just an aid uh, that, that our folks are putting together. The road design manual revisions themselves, uh, again, it's just the policy difference. It's, it's actually putting in some of these alternative uh, intersections and the analysis to do it. But it's also, these things could be done before, but if we put them as a standard, it's easier for people to choose from the menu. So that's something that uh, works out in the guidance that we've put in. And the roadway design manual is already incorporated complete streets, but we are actually putting in, uh, like I said, more specific examples on that. The other thing that's happening and was happening before is arterial management plans. Uh, these are done at the local level. VDOT participates. There's been three that are done. Uh, Chad Tucker in uh, our planning division has been working that in, on this side. Uh, the three, I think you've got Route 3 in Spotsylvania, and there's a few others. There's six more in progress. But that's something that also would encourage localities to incorporate these sorts of things. The I and I, we have an internal document that we're coming out, a memorandum on the design side for corridor studies. And again, that, that will also help. And the, uh, the management plans will be coordinated with OIPI. So this is something that, again, will tie into to VTRANS and, and, and the whole segments that we have. Another thing that really kind of goes beyond this that isn't originally in what we were asked to do by the committee, but there are advanced signal control technologies. We just had a meeting on some of that. We've actually been doing this the last uh, decade or so, uh, but this is something we're continuing where we can work with the localities and where we have to have signals where we just can't avoid them. Are there things we can do with timing? Uh, are there things we can do with synchronization and coordination? 
When you get into the urban areas, sometimes you have to override that manually because you're beyond capacity. But when you get into the more rural areas and some of those localities where, that are starting to build up, those are oftentimes the places where timing and coordination and synchronization have the best effect. So we're, we're strategizing on that and uh, have some internal working groups saying how do we do this and how do we find the, the, the places to get the best effect for our dollars there. Our next steps, and, and this is basically the outreach, communication, and training, something that should take place next uh, uh, in, in our, what we need to do internally. But we also, again, the VTRAN step in nailing down these draft segments, again, those are in your packet, uh, is something that will, will be, done, uh, be done by those that are working, in our, and we will reference those. So those are the next steps that we have. Are there any questions or, or anything that you all would like to discuss? Mr. Nunny, I, I, I will tell you, Mr. Chairman, I just want, as you know, um, this is one of my last meetings, and I, 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 I want to say that to Garrett, Garrett and I had a hard time hooking up <laughs> because he, he, he connecting because he, uh, he called me a bunch and I called him back. We just had a hard time getting up. But, but I can't tell you how impressed I am with the staff here that took this problem and put this solution to it. And when I'm talking about taking a problem and putting a solution to it, that's to me what this is. And, 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 and what we're going to need is somebody on the board to be a champion for this. There's going to have to be somebody that's watching every one of these things. Because if you want to look back in 20 years and say, boy, I wish 20 years ago somebody had done X, this is one of them. This is one of them, because every time we break the flow in these arterial networks, we are costing ourselves capacity and ultimately putting off a, a solution that's going to cost a lot of money. And so um, I, I really, I really, and, and, I, and I can't, you know, the mobility enhancement is as important. Um, there are things we can do in congested areas, and, and when we're on Mill Mountain, I'll show you that we can, it's just a great way to be able to see the valley, but you'll see the 460 going eastbound uh, out of Roanoke and all the stoplights on that, that that can be signalized, synchronized, worked on, um, and we can increase capacity, but the best cure is the, uh, is the prevention. And, and that's where, I mean, the rubber's going to meet the road. We've got one right now in my district that's a problem. And, and you know, it's, it's going to be hard to say no um, for a lot of these. So I just, I just want to thank Garrett. And we haven't had a chance to talk, but this is exactly what I was talking about. And, Mary, thank you for help, your help, too. And um, I really appreciate it. Mary, Ms. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, so uh, I, too, want to express um, gratefulness for the work of the staff. This was a little bit, diff you know, it started out as we're going to talk about two districts, and when we got into the conversation, it became clear that, no, this was actually something we needed to move policy-wise into VTRANS, and we needed to think more strategically. Um, and I think that William's exactly right, that the issue is how are we going to monitor what's going on going forward. Um, and I think, Mr. Secretary, that's one of those questions that I really hope we get to in August, because it shouldn't require that a member of the board be on it all the time. It, we should have a system that brings us the key information in a, in a manner that is helpful to us to make the next set of decisions. Um, and so I, I hope we can get there in our conversation in August on, on this and a number of other aspects. I sort of viewed this both as, as form and substance. I think we've developed a form now of working with the agency as to how, uh, you know, we, you know, we can do this. Plus we got a pretty substantive result. Now the, I agree hundred percent more. How do we monitor, uh, that, uh, and, and there is a couple of ways you like, you can have a champion, the guy that just every, every time asks for it, which, but, but I think you're right, it needs to be more institutionalized and where it is. And so, but I, I actually thought this was a good exercise, not only in this particular issue, but how we can do this going forward with others, the form, and how the interaction between this board and VDOT uh, is, and the Office of Intermodal Planning, how that all is, are we, how we monitor that we're moving the needle. 
as we talked about. So I think it was a great exercise. Really, I, Garrett, I'll throw, and Mr. Kilpatrick, throw my uh, support and, and, and thanks by, behind the way you've attacked, attacked it and embraced it and understanding it, what the board was getting to. And I think that's the type of cooperation we're going to need as we work through policy execution and monitoring. And yeah. thank you, and thank the board, too, for your yeah. guidance and kind of bouncing. There was a lot of bouncing ideas back and forth, and that was really helpful to, to get through this. Yes, sir. Thank you. I noted on the um, highway segmentation identification slide that Route 15 was not listed. Is, is um, what I will do is afterwards, if somebody wants to add or not add or, or comment on something, they are draft, and we will feed that for the VTrans. That, that's why it's there. We, we felt that that portion of it really was for the board's comment. Uh, you know, we, we kind of separated the, the, the standards and, and design part and then into the, what we would call the policy part. So, yeah. Ms. Valentine. Can I just add that when we um, start educating people about the importance of access management, that it's not just the monitoring piece. There's a real economic benefit to protecting these assets that we have and that, you, you know, educating localities when the tension is between economic development and tax revenue there's a real cost when the answer is a signal and so how can we be the more creative we are and you know the more we create mobility the it's actual a greater economic benefit yes ma'am and sometimes a better benefit long term to the developer i mean we've had discussions yes. where a developer will come in and that they're getting pressure from someone to put a signal or so there are other and I don't think this discussion has ended because there are, we, we've, we've, as we go forward, I'm sure there'll be future discussions on things we may need to amend as there's input from, from others. Being in VML yeah. and vacant. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, some of them are not going to be clear cut. I mean, that's what it, that's, you know, it is. They're not going to be. Some of them will be relatively and, and there might be a disagreement between where, where that, that's where Charlie thinks he has to take an action and the board policy. I mean, that's going to, but the key is we now have a process how we get that out and it's debated and, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll work through those. Yeah. Chairman, I'll say you're right. And, you know, uh, somebody wants to bring a thousand jobs and needs a stoplight. And that's where the, you know, that's where the rubber starts meeting the road and, so to speak, but I'll tell you, every one of these stoplights is special to someone. That's right. And like I tell my children, you're special just <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> oh, I, and that's why I agree, and that's why, you know, economic development, the more we team, because I will tell you, yes. I've been involved where there's almost no problem getting that stoplight, and they go on down the road, and, and, and there's a problem getting the stoplight. Or... There should be a problem, and politically it's gone too far, and, you know, the message comes down, put the stoplight in, you know, and that, and that stuff. So, so, I mean, I think that's, that's again, the, the, that in there, uh, in that. But at least now it's not just, you know, doing it, and because that's what we normally do. I think that's, 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 that's a big step forward. Okay, Mr. Moore, sure. thank you very much again for your, your work. Okay, now we get to part in the agenda, what everybody's been looking forward to, the six-year financial plan, and John going through, this is the time uh, that uh, he needs to brief you on a lot because you're going to vote next month on adopting all these, uh, and this will tie into smart scale, what's been decided all on that, so good morning, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Secretary, members of the board, Th this, um, th this, this, presentation will be less dramatic than presentations in the past um, as we've as we've talked um, with with the kind of the implementation of uh, House Bill 1887 and smart scale um, you, you've you heard most everything I'm going to tell you in, in January so um, we, 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 I know no one likes surprises so hopefully this will go smoothly um, what I want to do today though over over the course of the next two presentations is to outline the revenues that are available um, both for fiscal year 18 and through 2023 um, for the Commonwealth Transportation Fund, um, what's coming to, to VDOT, and then um, Mr. Pitter will speak later as to the components that go to the Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Um, as you know, 
we, we take this longer look to 2023, to you know, the six year picture, to be able to plan for um, the, the smart scale process, to look at those out year revenues. And, and as, as you know, a smart scale, the way we're implementing it is the last two years of the program. And then we will um, give you a, a kind of an overview of the six year improvement program, um, kind of highlighting the context or content in, in the program. As I mentioned, um, the, the revenues that we're working from are, are from the December 2016 forecast provided by the Department of Taxation. The, they are the exact same numbers that I presented to you in January and are the basis for the, the funding that are included um, in the, the budget, the, the, the financial plan, and in the six-year improvement program. So the, the $419 million reduction that we saw in years 2017 through 2022 um, are not new to you and it had already been incorporated in all the working numbers. Um, not to minimize the fact that we did have to, in, in building you know, this year's plan, address a $400 million reduction in revenue. Those reductions were largely driven by um, a, a lower reduced or a reduced expectation in revenue associated with um, retail sales and use taxes. And also there's some increase though in, in expectations related to motor vehicle sales and use. I'll, I'll say that as, as of today, we are trending, um, fiscal year 17 is trending slightly above um, the, the forecast as it was uh, adjusted in December. From a federal revenue perspective, um, I think the last time I spoke to you, we, we were still working under continuing resolutions. I'm, I'm glad to say that we now have an omnibus bill that uh, carries forward uh, 2017 based on the levels provided in the FAST Act. Uh, so we continue to use the FAST Act apportionment levels. Um, we do budget at, based on an obligation authority level, which is almost right at 95%. Um, you also may or may not know that within the omnibus bill that there is language um, directing or setting aside a component of, of Virginia's revenues to go toward the Arlington Memorial Bridge, and we'll be making that adjustment in the, in the final um, budget and program. For 2018, um, we're looking at a Commonwealth Transportation Fund budget totaling $5.77 billion. It's, it's slightly down from the, the 2017 budget. Uh, the, the two main drivers for that reduction are, uh, one, the, the reduction in the, the, the state revenues that I mentioned previously, and there's also about a $100 million reduction in plan bond proceeds. So again, that's, that's something that, that we control within the plan. 21%, um, about 21% of the total is from federal sources. Uh, the, the largest recipient of revenue, I'll say, is the Highway Maintenance and Operating Fund at about 35%. And about 9% of the total revenues um, actually are dedicated to the to two regions, Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. Looking at the, uh, the use of those revenues, uh, you'll see that the, the majority of the revenues... I'm ask, I'm ask, I just have a quick observation. He's going to get mad at me. Go back one slide. I just, this is, again, one of my last meetings. I just can't, I can't help myself. Go, can you go back <laughs> okay. one slide? I appreciate the question. I'm, I'm, sure, I, I'm certain. Can you move back one slide? I, I, well, another slide? I'm Backwards. Moved. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. There we go. Just want to point out that the federal government gives us 21% of the revenues and makes about 95% of the rules, but just now you can go forward. <laughs> That's going to be one of my things this afternoon. Welcome. We don't need Why any don't more you get up there this too. afternoon to fix that, Mr. Secretary? We don't need any more incentives to tell us what else to do with our money. <laughs> I would agree, Mr. Phelan. It was a very, very good point. Very yeah. good point. All right. Um, Again, look at, turning to the, the use of the revenues, um, about 38%, um, closer to almost 40%, if you include the DRPT component um, that is related, to, is related to maintenance and operations. Uh, that is followed by um, construction, which, uh, which gets about 27% uh, of the funds. And 
I know it's hard to read here on the screen, but I think you probably can read it better at your, at your table. Um, but that is kind of how the pie is sliced up when you, when you look at the distribution of, of the dollars. Just briefly, um, but if I just step back and, or step forward, I'll say, and look directly at just the VDOT component of the budget, um, the operating budget for 2018 is, a, is approximately $4.6 billion. And, uh, and, I, and I refer to the operating budget as, as the total, which is roughly $5.1 billion, <coughs> less, less the component that goes to the regional programs. And you see that basically in the middle of the page, the $492 million. Uh, that those monies are are dedicated and to the regions and and simply pass through to VDOT on the way to the regions. We have nothing to do with them other than to pass them through to the regions. And then we do work with the regions to to spend those dollars. But in terms of bu the budgeting process, that they are just a pass through. The major change you'll see on this slide really is, is on highway um, acquisition and construction right there, third from the top. Um, and that again is, is largely a product of construction is at the bottom of the, the, the funding waterfall and it, uh, it is impacted by the uh, reduction, reduction in state revenues as, as well as a reduction in the, um, the bond proceeds, the Garvey bond proceeds that are in the budget for 2018. Taking a wider look now at, to, at the full uh, six-year financial plan, 2018 to, through to 2023, we're looking at a total funding package of, of nearly $35 billion. Uh, we do continue um, to, to, to use bonds a, as in the past. We have a, a still continue to have a Garvey program and a CPR bond program uh, totaling about $800 million. And you'll also see you know, we, we continue to have um, some specific bonds used for uh, the Route 58 program, which again was um, legisl le legislatively increased uh, in 2013, I believe, a few, few years back. Uh, the, the total includes, um, again, the 38% share, again, approximately for maintenance and operations, of about $13 billion. Uh, there's about $9 billion f uh, directed to construction. And again, about $3 billion of that is to pass through to the regions. This slide uh, illustrates the revenue in terms of the, the major sources. And you, you see there that obviously the, the largest component is the very top, the Highway Maintenance and Operating Fund and the, the Transportation Trust Fund following below. Uh, the, the, the reductions you're seeing here um, really are are, are tied to you know, a reduction in the bond programs, which again is, is planned and, and strategically, um, I would say sized based on revenues and the need for the, for the bonds. And then the other difference you see really that's kind of impacting the, 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 the bottom line, I'll say, is the, the local and other revenues, um, which, which again are typically very project specific. Um, so th they, while it's a reduction, it's, it, you can't look at it as a reduction as you would in st standard um, tax revenues that come through the HMO or the TTF. So when you look at it, excluding th those factors, you're really ha looking at a program over program net reduction of, of about $30 million. Doesn't sound like much, but when you, when you, in, when you look at how growth should be occurring over the, six years on a $5 billion program, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger impact than, than the number may in, indicate. This shows the, the planned use of those allocations over the six-year window. Uh, you'll see some blank rows in the center uh, related to, to, to DRPT. Um, we will fill those in in the final update as we finalize the programs. Um, but you get the general sense of, of the funding. And again, the, the, the big impacts here are, really do show up in, in the areas of, um, of construction. DRPT is, is, a, is seeing some reductions as well, and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Pittert will speak to that a little later. Also, um, before I move off this slide, just point out that the regions, if you look at the very bottom, 
Hampton Road, both Hampton Roads and Northern Virginia do, are experiencing reductions, um, really from two different factors. No, no, Northern Virginia's is, is mostly impacted by reductions in retail sales. Uh, while retail sales has an impact on Hampton Roads, the bigger impact on Hampton Roads is the, the, the gas tax. Again, where the motor fuels tax you know, there isn't a floor in Hampton Roads, and the, the, the price remains low. And, and as we still see slow sales in, in motor fuels, um, we're continuing to see, you know, lower, than, less than expected revenues in that area. Uh, right. Northern Virginia is experiencing the same phenomenon, too. They do. It's just not part of it. They're For a mix of taxes, yeah. Northern Virginia has been receiving the, the gas tax, that 2.1% gas tax, for, for many years, and it doesn't flow through the, the, this, this program. It's separate and apart. The Virginia. But, but yes, you're sure. right. The experience is the same. I mean, but if we had a floor, they would get this a lift in their revenue. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, because both, both are under. Uh, but for, but uh, the Hampton Roads are, are a much more greater percentage of fuel taxes than Northern Virginia. They have a, you have a different mix of taxes. Don't get me wrong. You're right, the same experience, but it's more acute in the total because of the mix of the okay. collections right. of taxes in Hampton Roads. Okay. And that, John, can you go when we go back just one slide and look at Route 58? I just want to point out um, uh, now this is just the revenue side uh, in, in in the six-year plan. Another almost 600 million dollars coming in to be spent in that quarter. But and I was looking for it when we got to the expenditure side. I didn't break it out, but I think there's something like 1.6 billion dollars set aside for Route 58 in our construction plan. And, and, and so I, I just want to make, we're here, I want to point that out. I get a lot of times that there's not getting a lot of money. Uh, I'm going to say there is more, it needs more, but we don't highlight the fact that almost $1.6 billion is going to Route 58 in Southwest Virginia. That's that 58 corridor program, um, which has been going on for many years. Right. You know, to your point, Mr. Secretary, is about a billion six. The, the construction, what you see here are additional bond proceeds that are expected to be sold, support, supported by that, you know, the last legislation that was passed to kind of finish building out Lover's Leap and some of those remaining segments of, of 58. Mr. Chairman, so wait a minute. What's the figure? I believe the total bond authorization for, for that program was, was around a billion six. Over over 40 years or something, right? Uh, no, it hadn't been. 30 oh, years or 20. Whatever. I mean, since the program started. Since I'm saying our six-year plan. There's a. I mean, it, I don't know about that. Most most of that has been previously incurred. That's since the inception of the bond program. The program. The, program. And, and so yeah. how much is actually in the six-year plan? Obviously, the, the, the six hundred million six hundred will be plus, there. They could be. I don't. I'm not, don't don't think there's much in progress. Okay, so six hundred million. Okay, okay. So six hundred million in there. Point point. I, mean, I got a little. But want to point out, but there is fairly substantial money flowing to that project. No, I agree. I just think it, we have to be be careful and yeah. be clear about that. And that's also was not just for the Southwest Virginia portion of fifty. Oh, no, it was for that was fifty eight from the port to. Yeah, but most of it's now in Southwest. I, most of it's that's left exactly. All of these uh, these revenues are going to the segment uh, between Martinsville and um, Hillsville. I just it's one of those things that so I was doing left. in Northern Virginia that doesn't show up in our smart scale, but money's going in. And we have some other things like I'll concede 66. that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's other monies. So when people look at just smart scale, you don't see the whole Correct. story. Is all I'm trying to point out. And that's so. And I'm sorry, Miss. Somebody had a question. Had a question. Oh, what, uh, all right, Mr. Whitworth. Yeah, and help, help me with my math here a minute. I, everybody else must have gotten. I did. Uh, where you said that actually the reduction was only 30 million. Uh, I yes, sir. That. If you um, if you look at the the kind of the center of the page, which says total revenues, in the far right shows a reduction of 174 million. Right. And if you if you re offset that by that local revenue up above of a reduction of 140, which I said that 140 is kind of project specific. So if you kind of discount that, you, the difference is only 30 million dollars. Right. 
Yes, sir. What page are we on now, John, of the significant changes? Okay, thank you. Before he goes to that, on the allocations, if you could just speak for a minute, because I think that while it shows that there's an increase in the maintenance program, uh, John, if you could just talk for a minute about what we're, what actually is a, occurring as a, a program from what we had projected a year ago. Or the, what, the, the $100 million increase you see here um, is, again, is an increase of six years over six years. Um, but if you were to think about growing a $2 billion program <coughs> at 4% a year, you know, it, that number should be much, much bigger. And as, as we discussed in January, um, as part of addressing the, the revenue reduction, we, we took some just off the top reductions, I'll say, in, in 18 and 19, and then starting in 2020, I can't recall now whether it was in 2020 or 2021, um, we actually took a reduction right off the top, right off the base, I would say reset the base for the maintenance program. We cut $100 million out of the base and then allow it, allowed it to continue to regrow. Well, the money we put in from 460 is pretty much given back. Yeah, uh, I think and, is and, what, and what's, I think what over is. time it's important to note that what we have done is fundamentally lowered the basis that we grow the maintenance program. Now we hope to restore that if our revenue improves, and uh, we'll get a new revenue projection, official projection, I guess, uh, in the fall. But uh, uh, I mean that's our intent. But right now, I think it's important to note that we took a significant hit to the baseline of our of our maintenance program. Um, uh, and part of that was we always have to maintain this balance of capital improvements and ongoing maintenance and a commitment to, uh, to fund the, the smart scale program also. But again, we are looking to, to if, if our fiscal, our financial picture improves, to be able to push money back into the maintenance program. Only in government do you have an increase that's really a decrease. What we really did is didn't increase it as quickly as we wanted to. That's right. I mean, yeah. as quickly as we wanted to. But that's exactly right. We're, it would not be able to keep up probably with our goals without additional monies going in yeah. in that regard. So uh, in that. If you look at 2020, uh, you actually notice that it, it's a, it drops by about $40 million from, 2020, um, from 2019. Uh, what, what that reflects is we, the, the 2019 number w received its growth like it would normally receive, and the, then we reduced it by $100 million, roughly. So then you see it starting from 2020 and going outward, um, growing every year by $30 million or so. I would also point out that you can see he's probably keeping a very tight hold on administration and other programs. They've, um, uh, you know, so in terms of saying that that's growing, that's obviously not. And so, uh, you know, commend Mr. Kilpatrick, and they've been doing a good job keeping a tight ship. We're, we're, we're limiting growth um, yeah. within the administrative programs to basically a CPI adjustment. All right, just uh, kind of summarizing, uh, we, we and these numbers, again, all the base numbers are consistent with uh, the revenue estimates, we, that we presented in, in, 20, in January. Um, we have incorporated um, the fast lane grant or the fast lane monies for Atlantic Gateway, I should say. It's $165 million in federal funds that we're expecting to, to support that project. Um, we have also added in um, the two new toll facilities that will be opening later this year, the 64 uh, uh, in Hampton Roads and 66 inside the Beltway. Uh, they, they are not large revenue producers, but they, we've incorporated them into the budget. And what we, the only changes that you should really see between the, the draft budgets, which you have at your places today, and the budgets that will um, actually be brought to you in next month for action will be a potential adjustment in some local project participations. We, as we finalize the, the six-year program, we, we identify revenues that we are expecting from localities, and we'll incorporate that into the numbers, as well as, um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll update um, kind of the mix of how some of the dollars are distributed between VDOT and, and um, the Department of Real and Public Transportation. Okay. Uh. I think... I think I'm, 
I'm still here. If you're still here, I should say. It's your improvement program. That's right. Sort of like the words in golf. You're still up. Still up. <laughs> you don't want to hear. Okay. Right. There we go. All right. B bad penny. You can't get rid of me. Um, so now what I want to do is talk a little bit about just uh, the draft six year improvement program. Obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of discussion um, since January about the, the small scale process and the, the selection of those projects. Um, we're, we're now kind of coming to the culmination of that process, um, kind of bringing into to picture not just the smart scale process, but the, the programming of all the other construction dollars um, within, within the six year improvement program. Before you move on on that, I just want to all the people in the audience and people listening or maybe through uh, the live streaming, uh, all the comments we got at the public hearings and all, all went into the development of this, which is completely different than it was many years ago. So five months of comments and distribute them all and VDOT and all us working through it. So a big change in the program instead of getting it in May where everybody worked through and try to look at it. I mean, we've actually now for the second year, five years, and we've had actual comments. And some of the changes that have agreed to were a result of those comments. So I just want to point out, so these public hearings are not just perfunctory. They actually went through and were part of this decision-making process. They've gone from being standing in front of us and reading a wish list that they have no idea will ever be to giving us real actionable items that we can act on and people can understand. So just want to point that out. That's a, a sea change from where we were a few years ago. So, Mr. Secretary, I, I, um, to, to, your, to your credit and, and that of the commissioner and the director, I also want to point out that you know, the comments we've received have been, as you mentioned, very solid comments related to the projects, but they've also been very positive to the, the changes and the policies that y'all have put forward. So. Congratulations to y'all as well. Team effort, so we just got to keep keep it going. So, yep. this program uh, it is the second program now that is based on um, th that is distributing, I should say, the revenues from House Bill 1887 to State of Good Repair, uh, the District Grant Program, and to the High Priority Program, and the the distribution of, of monies based on Smart Scale. Um, it, it does distribute, um, I, I least identify for the highway construction program, all the projects that are intended to be funding over the six years and the types of funding plan to be used. Um, DRPT projects are also listed. And again, uh, I guess Jennifer and others will be, be speaking to that a little later. The program in total is, a, is a $18 billion, uh, just shy of uh, $15 billion related to highway construction and about $3.4 billion related to rail and public transportation. The program supports um, about a little over 3,500 projects. And included within the budget is, or within, these, within the program, I should say, are projects totaling um, $5.7 billion that are funded by other sources and kind of the, 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 biggest, the biggest number in that, this biggest single number in that is this, the six year, I mean, it's the uh, 66 outside the Beltway, that $3.3 .3 billion project that um, is being funded through, it's incorporated within the program, but obviously the funds don't flow through us to support it. So it's not reflected in, in budgetary numbers. In comparison, you can see how the program has changed over, over the last uh, three programs. Um, again, the, the big increase, you can see the, the 15, 16, and 17 programs were fairly consistent in size, um, hovering from 10 to $11 billion. Um, the big increase in this year's program is largely driven by uh, two things, 66 inside, outside the Beltway, and, and funding from HR TAC that is being used to provide some major, major work in Hampton Roads on 64. Looking at some statistics, um, the program includes the addition of 537 projects. And as you recall, the, this, this count is the, actually includes all the additions that were also done during the course of the year. So it's not just all of a sudden 500 projects have appeared. This is a culmination of, the, of all the projects that have been added since the last program was acted on. Uh, it does include 
uh, about 140 projects from smart scale, combination of round two and round one, because there were some breakouts from, from round one projects. Um, there are also um, about 80 state of good repair projects in that number, and, and many of them, over 300 of the projects, really relate to your special funded projects, safety projects, um, CMAC, RSTP, bridge, and there's some, some old secondary projects that were, that were added. You can see there were a number of projects um, that were removed from the program well, the, for, because they were either canceled or completed as we, as we clean up and, and kind of close out old projects. There were um, about the same number of projects that received allocation and increase in funding. Uh, most of those were related to you know, awards and just making estimate changes and, and obviously based on legacy projects, not, not smart scale projects that are just getting going and, and have their very tightly defined um, budgets. And then there were 100 and about 173 that actually received reductions, and again, largely for, this, for the same reasons. This program um, does, is based around the, the full funding or the full consensus scenario, the scenario that we was discussed um, previously. Um, the, the scenario that was based upon you know, the, the staff's recommendations. I, I believe there will be further discussion to, today and action potentially tomorrow to make some adjustments to that that will address the, the, the unprogrammed monies that are, that are remaining. Uh, there is about a billion dollars being distributed in, in this program. Um, 358 for district grant, 658 for high priority. And, and just for just to remind you, the way this billion dollars is, is not all new revenue. It is, is being made possible by the, the, I'll say, the reuse of $300 million that was intended for um, 66 that, that we found not to be needed. So that's being put back into the high priority of the projects program. And then that was $149 million that was previously planned for Virginia Beach Light Rail that, that was released and has been was split 50-50 between the high priority pro projects program and the district grant program. It wasn't also uh, $23 million that was made available through the repurposing of earmarks. If you, if you recall, uh, we, we, we took, made an e effort to go through and identify places that we could, could repurpose earmarks on, on round one projects. And by doing that, it made available, um, released those monies that were used in round one to be now used in round two. The, the, this, the full, fund, uh, full fund consensus scenario that was uh, included, um, it contains uh, 40 high priority projects totaling about $653 million, leaving uh, just shy of six million unprogrammed. There are 96 projects selected for the district grant program, totaling uh, just over $315 million, leaving about $43 million uh, unprogrammed. And again, I believe there will be further discussion about how to use those monies um, later today and tomorrow. The program, um, we, we discussed some of these key, key areas in January, um, but we are uh, allocating $96 million to the Innovation and Technology Transportation Fund, which is a, is a set aside from the High Priority Projects Program. And uh, there's $60 million to unpaved roads, which is a, is a set aside from the District Grant Program. And, the, and this program is, is based upon a revenue sharing program of $100 million annually. Within the, the six-year the six year window, there's $1.1 billion being allocated to state of good repair. The, pro, the program still contains um, a significant amount of funding and projects related to the optional CTB formula. If you recall that formula, which distributed money to, um, to pavements, bridges, high priority projects, uh, and a few other categories, um, continues as part of the code through 2020 when it fully sunsets and then 2021 being the first full year of, of pure use of the House Bill 1887 funding distribution formula. 
Uh, we are also um, working to consolidate the remaining funds from the, I'll call, they call it the, the old highway formula. If you go back to the 86 formula, what we always refer to as the 40-30-30 formula. Um, as you may recall, there was there's language in the Appropriation Act that says that all funds that were previously distributed through the formula to primary, secondary, and urban um, that haven't been uh, allocated to a project that's, that's underway or a fully funded project are, are to be swept and, and transferred to the state of good repair effective January 1 of 2018. So that, that process is underway and, and we'll probably speak more about that um, later in the year as, as we work towards um, the fall. So now, I thought I thought we'd already swept all those funds up. I thought that when we did the first round of smart scale, we took pro took took monies off the projects and and so I'm I'm curious as why we, why is there what what money's still out there that's sitting on projects that aren't going to get built. Most of what we're looking at now are are the local or the urban areas um, where they have obviously they have control of the funds and there's some in the secondary area as well. But the primary they have control the, of the fund. Because they were, it, the old formula, they the were pretty much dollars. entitlement funds. Mr. Franklin, the yeah, funds that we swept in 2014 were discretionary, discretionary funds, funds fully under the control of the board. So that a lot of times those were either primary funds in the old formula, or a lot of those funds were actually new revenues that were a result of the 2013 revenue bill, which went through the temporary CTB formula, which overrode the 40-30-30 formula and had statewide discretionary funds. So that $416 million or so, that was withdrawn from partially funded projects. That was not secondary or urban money. That is money that under the old laws, which have now been repealed, but are still applied to these funds, those were under the discretion of the local jurisdictions. And so the board had no real right to redeploy those funds. You had the right to reject secondary request, but you didn't have the discretion to reallocate those um, as you saw fit. So those funds remained on those projects However, we saw that there were tens of millions of dollars sitting in place. And so working with the governor and the secretary, we did add language to the Appropriations Act about a year ago that said basically it's use it or lose it time, boys. You can do whatever you want with this money as long as it's transportation, but if you don't do it by December of this year, we're taking the money back and we're going to go fix some bridges. So that's, that, that, that was in last year's budget language? Yes, sir. Yeah. So budget that will be in effect when this happens. Um, so it's in this, it's in, it's in this, Years it is, but the effective date is January 1, Got so it. it will be taken before the assembly has the option to go back and uh, revisit the revisit previous it. policy decision. Right, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Okay, I understand so that. that was, so it was, you, we, you had to have, we had to have a law passed to be able to do this. You I did not have I it. I understand that, yeah. Um, and so we have been working with several, you know, we've been telling them, and it has to be on Funded, yeah, funded projects. In other words, this is not putting on something fully funded. Trans, you know, you're gonna. I'm gonna put five million here and hope we get another minute here. Um, so uh, I know we've had specific conversations with Virginia Beach. Uh, and I know I've had specific conversations with, I believe, it was Chesterfield. They're look uh, pointing out to them. You know, we actually had VDOT go in and look at some of these contracts and say, you know, you've got some excess monies here. We're gonna be closing these contracts. Better put them on something, or we're going to pull. It. I think Virginia Beach ought to be under full notice that if we want our money back, we're going to we're going to get it back. He's already, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, we've had a pretty, I, yeah, you know, uh, blunt conversation <laughs> with them. But, but yeah, but so that's what's going on. Uh, we did not have the authority to do that without legislative approval. Does that apply to the CT? Projects that are still out there, or is that just for the primary? It's the, it's the old monies and the old formula. No money on the CTB. Okay. Yeah, we know of no more significant Money's just floating a float in the system or whatever to put it now uh, that is not under your control. Will we be advised or can we be advised uh, of those localities in our respective districts that have that? Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Some of them are working on it. Uh, well, you'll, you know, uh, I guess, like Charlie, can we, 
publish something here in November or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I see Kim back there yeah. and, and uh, yeah. uh, working with the district engineers and their planning folks. We can get lists of, of uh, what the available balances, what we, the current balances are. Air, or November, though, right? Yeah, we have our air schedule has us early, I'll say early fall. We, we early should have, fall. We, we, we're supposed to have the process completed working through with the localities. A, a lot of it's collaboration with the cities as to, because they're like, for instance, some of the cities control their projects. So VDOT doesn't know what's not, you know, they don't necessarily know what's left over in that. So, but it's a law. So if they don't do it, they've broken the law. It's not a, one of your actions, it's the law. So they are scrambling to, to try to get those identified. Or what we want them to do is put them on projects to move forward. I mean, we really don't want the money back. We want them you know, to put them on, well, Charlie might want it back, but, but, but I mean, <laughs> what we really want is the want project, project that's, gonna, that's, that's right, they're gonna complete. You know, no more of this setting around, you know, stashing monies away, so. All right, uh, just kind of summarizing uh, how the monies were distributed. There was a, a just shy of a billion one total in, a, in a, a funds totally available for the two programs. I mentioned the, the two set-asides that are for unpaved and for the innovation and technology fund, um, which, which left just over um, just 1.017 billion of, uh, that is distributed through smart scale and you see the the amounts there for each of the the two programs now this is uh we're going to discuss this afternoon this is after the revenue sharing was taken off the top too that's correct that's right so they didn't have it on here but uh that uh has been taken out how much is revenue sharing during the six-year program john a million a year so, so for six hundred million dollars six hundred million dollars so this slide shows the distribution of the, the, billion, the billion dollars. You see the, the 358 distributed by, by district. And again, the high priority is a statewide total. I'll make a comment here. Um, I, obviously, obviously, we monitor uh, public comment uh, and also the news clips we get, just like you, clips every morning of what's going on. And a lot of people, I think, are confusing uh, smart scale with the allocation of funds through House Bill 1887. In other words, they're saying smart scale is not working because I'm not getting the project. The issue really is not so much the project, how it's being analyzed, it's the amount of money that's going to the district by law. In other words, you know, they point out, well, we got, it's not, smart scale is not going to work because uh, the, our major project, we don't get enough monies for five years to do it. Well, that's not smart scale. That's the allocation, House Bill 1887, which was agreed on by the General Assembly. So I just want to point out there, there's been some miscommunication, I think some people not understanding. Smart scale is just how we evaluate projects. I mean, as, as you, all, you all know, only 27.5% is actually up for across the Commonwealth. Uh, it is the, I think what smart scale was doing with the House Bill 1887 is pointing out that we simply don't have enough money to do these projects. Like that was a theme with many of the public meetings in every district. There's a lot of projects that are good that are not getting done. But that's not a problem with smart scale. I mean, it might be a problem if you thought your project should have been scored better and with limited dollars you'd be happy, but somebody else would then be unhappy. The problem is we sent, we had nine and a half billion dollars in requests and we had a billion dollars to allocate. So I want to just point that out, that if you're looking to attack the issue of getting more project, it's, it is a funding issue. Whether we did it totally politically or whatever, it's not enough money to go around. So I just thought I'd make that comment because I've been seeing some, you know, op-eds and different things pushing back on smart scale when I don't think it's, you know, what, what we really have done is pointed out also, you know, what we're leaving on the table. It's not good or bad, or I guess, but it's just, you know, what we're leaving on the table, and this is the allocation agreed upon by the General Assembly. This is something we can't change. That's so. Secretary, to, to that point, just just a frame of reference to and look at looking forward, um, using fiscal year 2023 kind of as the proxy. Uh, round three w w looks like it would it would be about the same size as what we're looking at here. Um, probably right, right at a billion dollars as well. When you look at two years worth of, of funds directed to uh, 
through 1887. So 500 million in the program? Correct, correct. Yeah, about a billion dollars in total, about 500 in each. A little bit more it will be in the district grants that will be allocated. And That's again, true. remember, what, what it really packed this year, the percentage, it looks like it's a lot more than yet because of reverting funds back from 66 into where they came from by the right. that round. That was by law. So, um, so it looks like a little bit more will go through the formulas uh, in, in, in the coming year. But, I mean, I, I just want to point out, smart scale is how we evaluate. It is not uh, how, you know, it is not the major determinant in funding. It, that is the amount of money we have to fund. And driven by these formulas, the percentages that go to each district. Not so. This slide shows the, uh, the, the state of good repair funding that's being that's available over the six-year window. Uh, obviously, we, we talked about the 17 through 22 la last time. But again, this is the, the full window, $1.13 billion of the program that is dedicated to um, state of good repair. And you can see how that is divided out between what's going to VDOT pavement and bridges and local locality pavement and bridges. Yeah, let me just point out on there, too. That's one thing we, got to, we need to highlight more because, you know, almost an equal amount of coming through the formula is going to be coming through state of good repair. So when you're looking back at the past, you've got to add those two together and looking at how it would have been allocated before. So we started doing that, and we'll do that in our future public hearings, just putting both up because that's what's really coming to the district. In there, so and I think that uh, a lot of people say, "Oh gosh, it's not getting." Actually, every district is getting more than they were getting before, um, uh, and that was one of the things we passed out to all the legislators when we put this through for the formulas. But it is, you know, uh, smart scale and state of good repair through there. So, and again, this this slide just shows the the three programs together, so you can see the amounts that um that are being distributed to, to each district. Here we have shown the high priority pro pro program projects based on the the uh, scenario that it, that is in the draft program. I would say this is really the meaningful slide uh, in terms of where the monies are going uh, and looking at how you compare to other districts. Uh, and j just to be clear, um, as as Nick pointed out just then. The, the, what we are showing here for district grant and high priority is just the round two distributions. Uh, wrapping up, um, we, we, look to, we, we have summarized and provided you all the com public comments to date. I believe you have them um, on, on your thumb drives. Uh, we, we will make any revenue adjustments that may be necessary. Again, uh, I do, we won't be seeing any official forecasts from, from taxation or from Federal Highway, but we could have some, some minor adjustments related to local participation, uh, which don't impact the formula distributions. Uh, we will, uh, working with you, uh, finalize the, the consensus scenario for the, that will drive the, the final six-year improvement program, and we'll be back before you in, in June for uh, action on the, uh, the final six-year improvement program for 2018 through 2023. John, there's one thing you didn't mention. I think we probably should. It's not significantly impactful, but um, Memorial Bridge uh, and what's going to happen with um, our allocations. Sir, yeah, I think the yeah. board needs to be informed of that. Yes, the, the omnibus bill um, did include um, language that that in, in essence takes off the top of the funding provided to Virginia and D.C., a, a, an amount totaling $30 million to support um, the Memorial Bridge. Uh, the distribution, the shares taken from Virginia and D.C. are based upon the funding shares to the, the two um, air localities or two jurisdictions, I should say. And um, we believe the Virginia component will be about $26 million of the 30. So we will make that reflection in the, the final program and the final budget. And uh, we, we believe we have found some, some, I'll say, old discretionary federal funds that we can use to uh, address this. And, and so you don't, we don't see any impact to, to the um, funding through 
district grant or high priority uh, as a re result of this. Yes, uh, so, let me, I want to boil it down to make it about $26 million in federal dollars that would have been used on roads, on Virginia roads, are not going to be used on Virginia roads. They're going to be used to support the, the uh, rehabilitation of the Memorial Bridge. So I, that, I, I, I want to boil it down. Now we are, uh, John and his team have taken steps to ensure that it does not impact uh, programmed projects, but it is about $26 million less that can be used in Virginia. Th this all came about, uh, if you recall, last year there was this push for a grant for them and they wanted Virginia to participate, yet we correctly pointed out that the bridge does not touch Virginia borders. But they still, many Virginians use it, So, but under that logic, a lot of Maryland's use our roads and they're not paying for some of those roads either. But so from a from a executive or a, or a legislative standpoint, we could not put money on that bridge without legislative approval. We simply don't have the authority to do it. We suggested uh, that we would work with them because we do understand our Virginians use it. Um, uh, and we also said if there was going to be any Ta money taken, we would prefer it coming out of the bonus obligation. That is, monies that we don't normally expect. Uh, but that's not the way, you know, Congress chose to do it. They chose to take right off our allocation up top, along with the District of Columbia, monies to support that. Now, there's a whole lot of issues I got with this. I mean, it's not even a, a bridge owned by the District of Columbia. It's owned by the National uh, Park sure. Service. While they didn't fund it through there, that's what we pointed out. But the end, end, end result is uh, actions taken by Congress to, to remove $26 million in funding to Virginia for that rehabilitation. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Maybe, maybe our Attorney General designee here can help me, but just because they tell us we have to do it, does that trump the Virginia Constitution? It says we can't spend money outside it, it, of Commonwealth? It doesn't get to us. We never, we get, never it. get it. What are they? They're they just reducing our allocation. Who are they giving it to? Park Service. I mean, that they're it, reducing it, a future allocation. They're reducing this allocation. Their their appropriation. They're reducing it. They, they, which they have the right to do. So. They didn't take it from existing. No, I take it. They did the new to take any from the allocation. <clears throat> Now, it's an earmark, I think it's a bad precedent, and we're going to make that point, um, but, but this is money that never got in our control. They allocate money uh, uh, from the federal budget. So, I get it. So, yeah. so what, what, what we've been able to do, what John's been able to do, is take existing money under our control and put it in so that we actually get a full allocation. Because the way I understood it explained was we were taking that money and putting it on the bridge. No, no, we're not. We're, that we can do. We're, they're just reduced. They're okay. going to put it on a bridge, but it never gets into allocated to the Commonwealth of Virginia. In other words, if we were going to get a hundred million dollars, we are now going to get uh, seventy-four million dollars uh, of allocation going forward. May I ask an impolitic question? Where was our congressional delegation on this? That's a question that that uh, we have expressed our views to our congressional delegation. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, some don't share our views. In that the offline discussion might yeah. be better. But I want to say that um, oh, no. they did try, or they should try to get it out of <coughs> bonus allocation, uh, but it was uh, the Appropriation Act passed it um, coming out of, um, uh, out of our normal allocation. But it is, it, the bottom line is it's $26 million less. Now, will they make that up during the bonus allocation? I don't know. Yeah. This question. I think some of the federal workers and congressmen, everything ride on Metro. We think it's a bad precedent. We think it's a bad, an earmark, uh, which we didn't think Congress had the ability to do. I'm just pointing out to the board uh, that, it, that that's what happened. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Ha Mr. Chairman, um, did I hear you right, John, that we're, Virginia is covering $26 million on a $30 million project? That's correct? Not sure what the total value of the project is. Thirty million is what the budget uh, directed the, to. The, they got the a grant last year, and I can't remember Nick how much, how much ninety million. Um, so uh, this is an additional thirty million they're putting on that. 
Uh, that's the split between Virginia, D.C., based on how they apportion monies. Right. I, yeah. I guess the only concern I would express is um, this is, it actually is a terrible precedent in terms of use of the facility, it seems to me, um, and could play into all kinds of shenanigans around American Legion Bridge, which is another really difficult conversation. We, we concur. It is a ter we think it is a bad precedent, and it, we believe it's an earmark that Congress said they weren't going to do. Uh, but nonetheless, it is in the Appropriations Act. The Woodrow Wilson Bridge was the con Congress paid for that. The interstate. The interstate is an interstate, yes. So uh, you all know the issue has to deal with the, you know, the, that river, the Potomac River, since the Civil War has been controlled by either Maryland or uh, D.C. I think they called them the victors back then. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, uh, they control that water, unlike others. The bridge, there is a boundary channel behind where it dumps off into Arlington, and that is not on Virginia territory. So we did not have legislative or executive approval to put money on it. We've explained this, but you know we do understand. How, you know a lot of Virginians use the bridge, so I, I want to make sure that we understand that. Um, but um, that's the way Congress has chosen to fund uh, the memorial repa bridge uh, repairs. Secretary, I understand um, that the total bridge project is about 160 million dollars. We have questions about whether they have their matching funds and all that, but that's that's another issue. What you know, from your perspective, we wanted you to know that it was. Uh, it is twenty-six million dollars that we could have used elsewhere. Mr. Kilpatrick had a general comment about just the, an overall on on what's been going on with the program with John and Kim and their teams in the district. We spent a lot of effort trying to clean up the six-year plan and remove projects that we're not and should not continue to work on. So the, that's an ongoing process. Some of those used federal dollars. And I want to make clear, because sometimes people will use the term, well, we have to pay back. That we, if, if we don't finish this project, we're going to have to pay back the federal government. What we actually do is we unobligate the federal dollars that have been spent on that project. We take those federal dollars, apply them to another project, and fundamentally we have to put uh, find state dollars to put back on that we have already spent the money we have to change from federal to state money and close the project out so when you hear people say well if I don't finish this project we're gonna have to pay back the feds it's not actually what happens what we're really doing is taking the federal dollar off and reobligating it somewhere else that doesn't mean it's an easy process because what it means is we've got to find it within our system state dollars that we can then um, the state allocations, which we can then use to, uh, to balance, uh, balance our books. But again, what we are doing is taking those projects, if we don't intend to work on those projects in the six years, that those projects are removed from the program completely, and they're put into, we have a, what we call a project pool, which are all the things that we have worked on but are not in the program. So it will, will still have that information, but it will not be part of the six-year plan before, <coughs> because again, our intent is, if it's in the six-year plan, we intend to build that project within the six-year window. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lawson, thank you. Uh, we certainly want to try to get, we've got about 45 minutes. We want to get through DRPT's portion. I think that'd be a good place to. Yeah. To our team has to get back to Richmond. Richmond, too. So, uh, so um, are they taking the plane back? No, no they're driving. Okay, so Mr. I think Mr. Pitt, Mr. Pittard's up. So let's see if we are. Mr. Brule, we're going to see if we can get through this. we got about 45 minutes, uh, and that'll be a probably good place to break. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm going to lead off the presentation on behalf of DRPT and then turn it over to my uh, colleagues. Starting off giving you kind of a big picture view of all of the different partners that we work with across the Commonwealth. I think we think of things like Metro and we think of things like Amtrak and CSX, but we actually work with a number of transit systems around the Commonwealth, human, uh, human service transit providers, um, transportation demand management agencies, the MPOs, and some short line railroads. So our scope and our partners across the Commonwealth are pretty broad. 
To give you a, a quick impression of what it takes to put together the DRPT six-year improvement program, um, our program's built on a foundation of planning, um, working with our partners to develop uh, transit development plans. We do a lot of feasibility studies, corridor plans, regional plans, things that um, basically put together that network of projects that we're looking at along with our grantees as they start to put together projects and put together grant applications that are uh, submitted for consideration in the six-year program. <coughs> Shifting gears a little bit and talking about transit, I will say that the picture on the slide is a little bit out of date because we actually have more transit providers that are shown on the map. Um, but transit is, is really something that serves the majority of the Commonwealth. And I think we think of it as primarily an urban, uh, urban service. But we have transit systems in far southwest Virginia. We have demand response over most of the Commonwealth. So transit really is very impactful in the lives of our uh, citizens around the Commonwealth. To give you a few highlights um, of the six-year program for transit, the focus of the six-year program for us really is on achieving a state of good repair. We have a number of replacement revenue vehicles that are included in the program, 467 to be exact, a number of buses and rail cars that are scheduled to be rehabilitated in order to achieve a state of good repair, and some uh, replacement metro rail cars as well. Um, when we talk about state of good repair, we also include the WMATA PREA match that's $50 million a year through 2020. That is the um, Virginia share of the match to the $150 million that comes from uh, the feds to support WMATA. The program does include some very limited capacity expansion, um, very small um, focused um, expansion efforts. We have uh, 61 service expansion buses and we have 28 service expansion metro rail cars. These are predominantly being added to, um, in the case of metro, to lengthen the trains from six cars to eight cars. But for buses, it's to add additional rolling stock to help with um, spare ratios and also in to decrease headways on their services. Some actual physical capacity expansion or construction, a couple of uh, examples for you are the expansions of bus bays at East Falls Church Metro Station. If you've been there, there are buses that come in and out of there all day, so adding a couple of additional bus bays is pretty significant at that metro station. It's, uh, <laughs> we've also got funding in the program. Uh, to work on preliminary engineering for the extension of the transit way, which is the bus rapid transit that connects, currently connects Crystal City and Potomac Yard. Um, this engineering would allow for um, some design work to occur uh, about extending that service to Pentagon City. In addition, we've got um, some other types of projects that are in the program that you might not think about. Uh, that aren't as traditional. Um, we've got safety enhancements. An example of that would be um, an advanced warning intersection control system for the uh, tide light rail system in Norfolk. And this is to help those conflicts between the light rail pedestrians and vehicles in downtown Norfolk. We've also got some other facility and fleet improvements uh, related to Union Station, which is where all the VRE trains uh, start their return trips southbound in the afternoon. Um, some bus stop accessibility improvements in Arlington County, and engineering and design for new transfer facility for the Williamsburg Area Transit Authority. We've also got some, some different things that we do that probably don't come to mind as, as quickly when you think about transit programs, looking at travel demand management and also employing new technologies. There's a couple that I want to point out to you. The driver assistance systems and pedestrian collision avoidance technology this is something new. It's new technology that can be retrofitted on buses and help that driver avoid potential collisions with pedestrians. Um, we're looking to deploy that um, on specific projects around the state. This is a pilot. We're actually working with Greater Lynchburg Transit um, for their new vehicle that's going to be the downtown circulator and to have that technology added to that vehicle. We also do projects like School Pool, which is about reducing uh, travel demand around schools. And I have a, a seven-year-old, and he'd be perfectly happy if I drove him to school every day. Um, but if you think about that, if everybody drove their child to school every day, how much congestion that would create around our schools. So we actually have two school pool projects, one with uh, uh, Arlington County and one with the Dulles Area Transportation Authority. 
Finally, the last project that I want to mention specifically is in the town of Blacksburg, and it's a pilot project for bike share. This is a little out of the norm for us, but Blacksburg's one of those areas that has great potential for a bike share program to help with those first mile, last mile connections with the transit system. There's not another source of funding um, that's readily available for them, so we think this is a good opportunity to pilot with them, put a little seed money into a program to help them get started. <coughs> to talk a little bit about what we do with the applications when they come to us and how we um, allocate funding. We get lots of applications from those transit providers around the Commonwealth. And when we do, the first thing that we do is we look at their existing grants, um, both federal <coughs> and state. We look at their existing projects, how they're progressing. Um, we look at, you know, their state of good repair. We have lots of information on their inventory. And we use all of that information to help make recommendations for capital funding and what projects should move forward. Our program also continues the application of the TISDAC, um, Transit Service Delivery Advisory Committee, operation assistant, Operating Assistance and Capital Program methodology that's been in, a, in place, um, operating beginning with 2014 and capital beginning in 2015. Um, so we're continuing that process as, as has been in place. In terms of operating, um, there's $115.2 million that's uh, allocated in the traditional manner. Uh, the balance of funding for operating, which is $76.2 million, is allocated based on performance. So we collect a lot of data from our providers. Um, we look at net cost per rider, riders per revenue mile, and riders per revenue hour in allocating that balance of operating. For the capital program, um, there is a tiered prioritization process that's in place. It's been in place since 2015 um, that establishes prioritization through matching rates. So those projects that are tier one or the highest priority are funded at 68% state share, and that's for rolling stock replacement or expansion, rolling stock in addition to state of good repair, and those things that are related to that rolling stock. Tier two is funded at 34% state share, and that's infrastructure and facilities. Um, and tier three is funded at 17% state share, that's support vehicles, shop equipment, basically anything that doesn't fit into those first two tiers. Um, those tier levels have been funded at the same rates in the past, so we're able to continue moving that same tier rate forward into the current fiscal year. And with that, we're gonna transition from transit to rail. Rosa. Totally heard over the years is um, that the capital money is great. You know, buy new buses, buy new equipment. That the operating funding is always the challenge. And I know there have been smart scale projects where they were deemed to be more operating money than capital money. Do you feel like the balance uh, is adequate um, in terms of, well, and I'm asking an opinion, I guess, but in, in terms of the ability of these transit Answer is no. Yeah, I, mean, I, would say, I, would, I would say that we have challenges in both capital and operating. I think smart scale project, transit projects have been very successful in smart scale from a capital perspective. That's why you see, I mean, that's where you're really seeing expansion projects for transit. They're being funded through smart scale. Um, we hear the same thing, but the challenges are really on both sides of that equation. There's, um, we've presented to the board a couple of times now about um, transit capital funding going out a few years into the future. Steve's gonna touch on it in his slides in a few minutes, but um, you know, it is in the near future where we may not be able to fund all the state of good repair needs and take care of what's replacing the assets that are already in, in place. So I would say the challenge is on both sides of that equation. Um, the second question I have, is there uh, any differentiation, I'm not necessarily advocating there should be, but any differentiation between an urban transit system, because some of the allocation is based on ridership, miles per passenger, versus say a university town that automatically will have an increased ridership based on the student population. So I think you often have, and I know it's all about people moving, but you'll often, uh, it appears to me from the numbers, have uh, urban centers that really, the transit system is a necessity for many people versus 
a, a university area where the university isn't necessarily contributing much, but the ridership is so much higher, and it's not just convenience, but it is more of a convenience versus a need. And I think what's important to remember, and it's actually up on the slide right now, is that they're not, we're not, the performance metrics are not about how many people they move compared to others. It's really looking at their performance over time. So their, their ratings and their, their rankings are based on how they're performing year over year themselves. So it's sort of a level playing field. I mean, obviously we've got big providers and then we've got small providers. Even those small urban areas that have a transit system, that's very important to them, even if their ridership is smaller because they don't have kind of that captive population with a university center. So I would say the process is balanced so that there's not a disproportionate share. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. There you go. Right. Thanks, Jen. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to say thank you very much, as you can see on your map, these are the uh, huge number of passenger and freight rail projects we have done across the Commonwealth uh, that are currently active as well as the future projects within our SIP. So we've uh, got a very active, engaging rail program. And we're very excited about the future. So our funding mechanisms, of course, are IPROC and REF. You can see what the SIP allocation is coming up. Uh, I'm going to touch a little bit on this, but we have a very rigorous analysis in order make sure we're getting return for Virginia dollars uh, with those investment. In our Railway Preservation Fund, uh, we partner very closely with our short lines to make sure we're meeting their priority, uh, as well as supporting some of the regional and economic benefits uh, with local businesses that they continue to have access and enjoy access through our short lines. Uh, but I would say none of this would be possible without the CTB Rail Subcommittee. Uh, the committee is a driver and provides huge feedback as, as well as we did this morning uh, to some of our analysis that, that we do throughout our rail plan. So uh, within REF, we go through a very rigorous benefit cost analysis. Both, you know, here are the five major metrics that we are taking a hard look at, the truck congestion, safety improvements, uh, passenger ridership improvements, some of the environmental factors that are provide a contribution to Virginia dollars, and as a result, we come up with a uh, rate of return associated with those project paybacks. In IPROC, we look at the overall network benefit, uh, as well as some regional economic, social, and some of those also very similar environmental benefits, uh, but also the independent utility associated with each project. And in rail preservation, not only are we working very hard to preserve the economic uh, vitality of the short lines within Virginia uh, from a long-term basis, but we're also working very hard to improve the market accessibility. I'm going to come back to that here in just a moment as we talk about their market accessibility associated with the Class 1 carriers. But at the end of the day, it's about removing trucks off the highway for our short lines and helping provide benefit. And if I could just, uh, excuse me, Pete, but I just wanted to highlight, I know with the smart scale process, we spend a lot of time talking about picking the best projects. And the reason we wanted to highlight this here is to, to let you all know that we do the same thing on the rail program. We've identified goals. We have very quantitative measures that we use to rate projects and select them. We apply a benefit cost analysis to it as well and use that. And we've, with the help of the rail committee, have updated those and um, in some cases even strengthened them um, to make sure that we're able to perform a very rigorous analysis. So. So thank you, Jennifer, because that investment in private infrastructure for a pu public-private benefit is crucial for the benefits for the citizens of Virginia. Um, we also focus a lot on joint corridors where both the freight and passenger benefits can, you know, can be uh, tangible for Virginia. I-95, the I-64 corridor, obviously the Route 29. <coughs> um, and so here's some of our major rail projects uh, that are underway and getting cranked up. Our big one I'll touch on here in just a moment is Atlantic Gateway for $535 million. Uh, VRE platforms and the track improvements join the smart scale. Uh, projects. Uh, we've got an Ackayard bypass main line. Some of those benefits have already been implemented, but this year we're going to install the new western bypass in Ackayard. That's going to get rid of a major congestion point on the south end of Ackayard that's been there forever since that yard was created. 
uh, as well as we're going to get our first benefits from that by having the two new Norfolk trains uh, be part of this, that outcome from that project. Uh, we are working very closely with the City of Newport News uh, and with Amtrak for a new Newport News station and servicing facility for the passenger train. Uh, we've got uh, three port projects that are working uh, together with, uh, with Virginia Port. Part of that is uh, internal to the port. We're redoing some of the yard and adding some additional track capacity. Uh, we are also working with the Commonwealth Railway and their marshaling yard to expand capacity for this change in uh, freight that is coming and it's improving the port output from 33% rail to 40% rail. Uh, and the last part of the port project is up at Front Royal and adding two more tracks to the Front Royal Inland Port. Uh, we also have a, a new project with Norfolk Southern. These are the F-plate cars. What that means is we're taking 300 trucks off the highway that all ship truck today at a West Point going down to Buckingham Branch and putting them into rail cars and cycling those back and forth to have a direct benefit to Virginia's highways. So Atlanta Gateway, uh, we are getting cranked up. We got a lot getting ready to start. The first project is Segment A. Segment A runs from the Occoquan River uh, up to just south of Alexandria. Uh, this year will be about $52 million, and we're working very closely with CSX on design and construction agreements. We are working uh, on a master corridor agreement. That will be a long-term approach. Uh, we will then launch into design and signals. 30% of that is design. And uh, again, we're also working very closely uh, with Fairfax County and VDOT on a very collaborative approach so we can take in mind those future projects where bridges and rail bridges come together. We'll then go into Long Bridge Phase 1. Uh, we're expecting 30% design by next spring from DC to RVA and uh, have uh, that under construction by 2021. The reason why that's critical is not only is that the next big project of Atlantic Gateway, but uh, that does two things. That launches us into uh, the NEPA efforts that is currently underway with DDOT for the actual Long Bridge across the Potomac and into DC. That in turn also triggers our S-line uh, benefit that we get from CSX, which runs from Richmond down to the North Carolina, and we can rebuild that railroad. So, Railway Preservation Fund, uh, you can see we got a lot going on with our short lines. A lot of it is maintenance uh, to keep our short lines going, but I want to point out a couple things here. We also do capacity projects. So you can see under the Shenandoah Valley, we're putting in a couple of new sidings. <laughs> Uh, and that's because their new business that they've got going on is going so well, they need a siding lengthened to help enjoy that new capacity. So we also do capacity upgrades for short lines. And one of the big ones that we are really starting to tackle now is improving the short line bridges to 286. 286 type cars, 286,000 pounds of stuff in a railroad car has been the new standard in the class one carriers for the past 10 years. Having the short lines be able to match that same market accessibility so they don't restrict customers from being able to use those same size cars is critical. So not only are we you know, improving on the bridges, but we're getting them upgraded to the new standard as well and keeping our short lines competitive. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. So I'm going to run through uh, a few slides uh, to give you some perspective on the numbers behind the program that both Jen and Pete spoke on, the different projects. And this first slide is basically giving you a comparison, a five-year look back of our combined six-year program for the last five years. And you'll notice that uh, I think the first thing that jumps out is we do have a decrease from last year's six-year program to this year's six-year program of about three hundred million dollars and that's primarily in the it's in the transit side and what that is it's the Virginia Beach light rail project being removed it's the hundred and ten million dollars a year of bond funds that when you get to the out years you're losing those funds so it's another year of zero of hundred and ten of bond funds and then finally uh, as Mr. Lawson spoke about earlier there were some revenue reductions 
in the official forecast in the current year, and that was about $100, $110 million over the life of the six year in the transit program. On the rail side, they lost about $30 million over the six years as far as revenues. However, uh, we did a better job allocating our unobligated balances in the out years. And also we had um, some PTF priority transportation funds were utilized to fund the Atlantic Gateway project that Mr. Burris spoke on. The next slide uh, goes into the transit program and, it, and really this slide is just giving you a breakdown and it touches a little bit on what Mr. Rosen's question earlier got at as, as far as the operating capital and then we have some special uh, programs in the transit area. Um, and what you're gonna see is right now it's almost about 50-50 operating to capital. As we get further and further away from losing the bond funds, which are all capital, it's going to get more about 60-40 um, between the operating and capital funds. And I feel like I can't hit on this enough, but if you notice the big drop between FY20 and FY21, that represents the loss of the CPR bond funds, um, the full loss of those, um, which is going to have a very detrimental effect to the capital program. The next slide goes further, drill down further on the transit operations. And uh, what you'll see here is, and, and I think to get to your question earlier, Mr. Rosen, um, in 08, um, there was an in this transportation initiative and I was, phone call was made to me and the question was, what would it take to get the state to a 40% share of the total? And I think we backed into like $45 million of recordation tax. So that's what went, we went, went forward. General Assembly approved that. Then we went through a severe crisis in the housing market. So those revenues ended up being about $22 million a year. And at the same time, you'll see in this chart, the cost grew substantially. And what was going on during that time was both insurance, premiums, and then gas was going up significantly during that time. Thankfully, the last three years, the costs have leveled off, but the revenues and recordation haven't really ever recovered to the level we thought. And as you can see, the share at the bottom, the orange piece, is really the state share. And all we really did is maintain the 20% we were back before that initiative. Um, that being said, about of the total here, about 35% is fare box revenues, what we collect from our customers. About 35% is being paid by localities. We're paying about 20%, and then that leaves about 10% for some other revenues and federal funds. The next slide is a decision that we're recommending to you as a board in the six-year program. Um, as y'all may recall, in the last couple of years, we've been putting funds towards an operating and capital reserve for transit, and that reserve is capped at $10 million. And last year, we reached the full $10 million put into the reserve. Last year in the six-year program, we also had projected operating funding at $192 million. With the revenue reductions that we had, we only have $187 million to allocate. So we are recommending to the board to utilize the reserve. This is the exact reason we set the reserve up to try to provide some stability and predictability to our grantees. So we're gonna recommend and in the program that we've presented to utilize $5.7 million of the reserve to bring, to bring that operating number up to the number we put in the plan last year. The next slide touches on uh, what Director Mitchell brought up, and this is pointing out, once again, the loss of the bond funds, and it shows the impact. So if you look at 2018 uh, by itself, um, and you remove that $110 million, it's a 44% reduction in our transit capital revenues available. And I guess I'll be remiss to, to, to not say, you know, Mr. Williams is chairing, you know, we're working with the Revenue Advisory Board on this exact issue. And in June, I think we briefed you in March, in June we're going to be coming back with, um, I think we'll have a draft uh, proposal, a draft uh, report, and we'll come back in June to brief y'all on that 
issue. And finally, on the rail side, um, like I said earlier, relatively flat. We've done a better <coughs> job allocating funds. Our rail partners are still nervous about making longer term commitments due to some economic uncertainty. Um, what happened several years ago, uh, we had <coughs> lots of projects that rely on uh, car loads and containers taken off the roads and put on the rail and there's clawback provisions in these agreements and then uh, we had the banking crisis and the mini depression, I'll call it, and uh, that caused a lot of those agreements. We had to extend some to, to get to, and then also it caused a lot of the rail partners to actually back away from some of those projects. And so there's a little bit of uneasiness about long term when you get out to year five and six. Also would be remiss if I didn't mention here that we did lose, um, in the 2015 session, we did lose um, one third of the uh, rental tax revenues that are dedicated to rail enhancement. Um, but also, and I, we don't talk about this a whole lot, but the rail fund gets 12 point, has been getting 12.9, basically $13 million a year of bond funds. So this year, 18 is the last year those funds are available for the program. So there's a loss also of those funds. And finally, this last slide just gives you an idea of what we have, uh, what we're going to be working on between now and we come back in June. Um, but essentially, you know, we have our, our administrative budget um, and we're, we're just finalizing the detail of that um, and the total of that is $13.9 million. So we're finalizing the actual line item detail. Also, the five out years of the transit capital plan, we're still reviewing those needs information to try to get them um, vetted into a better uh, state. And then finally, there are a few projects that we did this year push kind of hard on our grantees that if they had projects that have been building up, um, I, they weren't moving the old projects, we kind of pushed hard on and looked harder at their current applications in relation to those older projects to, to say, if you've already got a bus stop shelter grant and that one hasn't moved and if you're asking for more, we need a better plan of why this one isn't moving. So there's a few of those grants that we're still in discussions with the grantees about, so it's possible some of those may be added in later. And with that, we'll be glad to take any questions. Um, what what conflicts do you currently have with passenger and freight rail? And in the future, what's your thoughts about that becoming more or less challenging? Can you repeat the first part? The, the conflicts between passenger and freight rail. Um, yeah, I, I, this is my opinion. I, I think when the IPROC fund was set up, it, uh, it provided for both operations and capital funding. And I think uh, it set a program for us that without matching requirements and maybe less of a benefit, cost-benefit analysis, it set two programs between that and the REF that were somewhat in competition. Um, that's us. As far as industry, I don't know if I would defer to Pete, maybe, if you're talking more generically. Our, you know, just complex in general with our partners and... Um I, I think it's fair to say that the industry is going through a transformation right now, and particularly the class ones that we have located here in Virginia. Um, passenger rail is, is um, not necessarily compatible with their business plans right now. So I think that from that standpoint, um, if that's what we're also talking about, conflicts in terms of the that's, impact that passenger, meant, yeah. yeah, and the impacts that passenger rail has on their freight transportation, I think is, they're very, there's a lot of concerns about that. So. Yeah, we're seeing that uh, uh, with projects, you know, we have to negotiate slots, and we're saying they want us to pay freight-like uh, provisions if they're going to give up slots. Significantly more uh, monies and uh, than uh, 
we have seen the relationship in previous years. I, I guess that's my point, because I see an inherent potential conflict that both the freight business and passenger business. It's been going on a long time, and I think it's, re it's reaching an acute uh, in some of these because of their focus on profitability. Look, we're talking about Norfolk Southern and CSX. Both have gone through fairly significant restructurings, one with new man both with new management, one external in CSX, one internal in Norfolk Southern. Both have uh, been criticized as being, um, uh, their shareholders have said not as efficient, and so they are retrenching or moving back their plans uh, to, uh, to their core businesses, which are freight. I would say probably at the um, Port of Virginia, uh, that's uh, and, you know, uh, a, a very compatible relationship. Uh, and we have a very good um, rapport in that regard because that's the uh, same way with CSX. When it comes to uh, putting passenger rail, that's a different story. That's in competition to their core business. At least that's their position now. Position now. And so they're saying, you know, if you want to look at our capital costs, they want capital-like returns uh, for giving up that space on what they consider to be limited architecture. I, I guess that's, I guess that's my is. question. I know we have plans and strategic <coughs> plans, um, and I just see this conflict potentially bubbling even greater than it is today. And. Uh, it just seems to be challenging for us to ex execute with those unknowns. Where there's a, a specific relationship, I think, which we have on Atlantic Gateway, where they see a much more one-for-one -one relationship of getting these expanded rail and their freight, we're finding that they're more amenable. And I'm not just happen to be, but what we're finding where we have a, a uh, passenger rail service, that they don't eat, think enhances the repairs, wouldn't enhance their freight or actually impair their freight. That's some of the positions. They're taking a much different view, a much different view in that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, yes. I seem to recall that we provide, C the state provides CSX in Norfolk Southern a certain allocation of money each year. Is it, that accurate? It's not a guaranteed yeah, allocation. Yeah, it's um, our rail funds are all application driven, and so it really depends on what they come in with. Um, and so, but there's no, there are some years that Norfolk Southern may have more applications and more funding in the six year plan, and others where there may be more uh, projects on the CSX network. But it's not a set distribution or anything like that. What's the funding? What's that? What's the funding for? Oh, just pro it's got to be for capital projects. But so not, not passenger rail. No, no mainly well, even in, we're interested in is passenger rail. Mainly. Yeah, so even in cases, typically we're funding capital projects in exchange for getting a slot, a passenger slot or, or multiple slots um, on one of their lines. So that, that's essentially the currency that we have to, uh, to get access for uh, passenger trains. Presumably, if we have trouble getting passenger slots, then we're not going to be approving applications as frequently? Oh, it doesn't work quite like that uh, because I want to make sure we understand that they are, they are a great freight partner. They are great freight partners also. So, I mean, the Port of Virginia success is also inherently tied uh, because we are the largest movement of freight uh, by any railroad, almost 40 percent, and that's where the targeted growth is going to go. So I don't want to infer to you that we don't have a good relationship, but they don't view passenger rail in the same mindset that we would. Now, does that um, um, uh, mean that we can't work deals with them? The answer is no. Um, but if they deem a, critter, a quarter is, is degraded because we've put additional freight or uh, passenger rail, they, they have to explain that to their shareholders. In that, so um, I, I, want, I want to make it clear that uh, they are great partners in both, and they are extremely important to the success of the Port of Virginia. So that's the what we have to keep in mind. Uh, don't get me wrong; we we are probably you know we probably do advocate for more passenger rail than they would want to see because I think they want to see zero. I mean, I, I think that's a fair 
way to say. I mean, that, it's not their core business. I shouldn't say zero. They're good corporate citizens. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, is that um, um, that is, you know, we have to find where um, we're servicing both. And that is the issue with running passenger rail on privately owned rail networks. I mean, you know, I mean, and I think that's where people, uh, I think a misused term in many, that I've found in everything I've done, whether it's P3s, is fiduciary responsibility. Their fiduciary responsibility is different than our fiduciary responsibility, and they own the tracks. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that they're, they're being unrealistic. They're being tough, but because that's their fiduciary responsibility. Now, do I think that's gonna cost us more to get additional passenger rail? I think the answer is absolutely yes. But that doesn't mean that, it's, that, you know, that we can't accomplish it and, and we're gonna to have to find where those enhancements for passenger rail also, for a minimum, are not a detriment to their operations and Quite frankly, we need to find those instances where they're increasing. I'll use the Atlantic Gateway. Those 14 miles of additional track are significant investments, a significant increase in their uh, freight capacity. Significant. It's only going to help us with our passenger rail, too. An isolated line, or I'll use where we're just, uh, uh, you know, it's not a main line, uh, but, a, but for passenger rail, we want to add another train and they don't see any benefits uh, uh, to their passenger, um, then they're gonna ask for where they do get benefits. So it's not bad or good, it's just the fact of, of, of the reality we're dealing with. So. Mr. Chair, and I was being a little yeah. facetious. Yeah. I was fortunate to get a tour of the Virginia International Gateway, and I, I, I get the benefit in, in the freight, but as Mr. Malvin said, I mean, this is a conflict that from a people moving, which is our yes, whole sir. purpose is to move people, you know, hopefully we can. And freight. Keep the. Our purpose is to move people and freight. Yeah, and freight. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mr. Fallon. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'd like to, to give the uh, group the benefit of my perspective, which I'm sure is going to be really scintillating, but <laughs> as, uh, as former chairman of the Port Authority, um, I can tell you that it is a very, very uh, important relationship between railroads and the port. I'll also tell you that the port subsidizes some of that too. This is, this is not all a one-way street. And That's sitting right. in a town in a building that was formerly owned by this corporate citizen that right. vamoosed, um, you know, I think it is, there's a tension there and there should be, and I'm not, I'm not fussing at the railroad. They're, they're, their bottom lines to their shareholders. But there is a significant public role in these tracks and in, in their ability to operate. Um, one of the concerns I have is when, and when we budget, and it, Steve, you may be able to help me with this, but I look at, the, at like uh, page 18 of the budget and, and it looks to me like 90% of the rail investments for the budget are into passenger and about 10% into freight, according to how we characterize them. Just in right. round numbers. It's important to note that all of these projects have dual benefits. So no. even though we may call them passenger projects and they may be funded out of our inner city passenger rail fund, as I mentioned before, these are capital projects which have freight benefits as that's, well. That's exactly where yeah. I'm going. I, th I think they're misnomered because I think all these passenger rail things are a negotiation about how much freight rail benefit they get out of them. That is exactly what they are. And I think we should not be calling them passenger benefits. I think we ought to be putting more of these into the freight rail because what happens is the freight, and by the way, the freight rail improvements, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, are not always necessarily linked directly to the passenger slot. That's correct. In other words, they go down and they go, well, we kind of need some something down the track. And to me, that is really holding us hostage. And so when we go to the value of those slots, I want to make sure we're accounting for the capital improvements we're doing elsewhere. No, and, no, and, and we do, but I, let me just, what's acute about this is the restructuring both are going through. In other words, this has always been the case. I'm just pointing, I'm pointing out now, both have been subjects of takeovers. 
Uh, one has, uh, is, is now a new chairman um, and is reducing. That's the other thing we need to point out here. They are reducing their operational facilities uh, because of efficiencies. At least, at least I know CSX is. I can't say. So I think the opportunities exist. I'm just pointing out to you that uh, we, we got to be hard negotiators, uh, but they are our partners. Yeah. I get it. I, I, I agree. Um, let, me, let me switch gears here while I have the floor. On the Ashland Bypass, where is that in terms of how much money do we have set aside for it or the Ashland Bypass? I, I may have yeah. uh, <laughs> fucking that's slipped there. That's I right. will be happy to but, clarify uh, that. <laughs> but uh, in the Ashland, uh, <laughs> the, the untangling of the problem that is Ashland. Third yeah, I can give you an update um, on that. We're, we are, it's actually, we don't have money set aside. as It's part of our DC to RVA EIS, so it's kind of the study is being funded through that. But the, um, right now, we're starting the Community Advisory Committee uh, next week, actually. On the 22nd is our first meeting. And um, we'll be meeting in Ashland. They've nominated people from the community to serve on this group. We are also doing some additional work right now with FRA on some um, analytical work as well. So, yeah. When does FRA make the, make the decisions, like around Fredericksburg, their decision around Ashland. I'm just, I'm, I don't, I, because I'm not exposed to it all the time, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing how we're keeping the, uh, to use the metaphor, train running on time here. I think, I think we've, we've pulled this decision out of there. I, I'm just not clear on where we are and whether any money needs to be budgeted. We know we're going to spend money there. I just want to know if we have any money budgeted to spend there. Not, not for infrastructure. We're still just studying it. So it's, it's part of the DC to RVA. There's no, funding in the six-year program aside from Atlantic Gateway for anything on this corridor. Um, I think it's fair to say that, um, and we still don't know, we're, we're looking at this alternative. It's, we are not pulling it out as a separate study. We are doing some additional community work, but FRA has asked us to keep it in the DC to RVA study. It's, um, but these, it, the decisions will be in the, over the next year by this board, um, and FRA would then either corroborate or not corroborate those choices. The, um, but what? any funding for actually building anything would be many, many when, years off. When does FRA make a decision the, on, whether we're on, on, on Richmond to D.C.? When do they say this we're still is what we want to do? We're looking at 2018 at this point. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, may I ask one more question, Mr. Sure. Chairman? Yep. Uh, on, on the transit and rail expenditures, do we have that, it would be interesting for me, and I don't know if anybody else would, ag would agree with this, to have the transit and rail expenditures broken down by transportation district. I looked through the whole thing, I can't find it, I may have missed it. Is that, is that in here somewhere? Um, I, are you looking at the budget document maybe versus the six year Looking program? at everything you got on this computer here, whatever. It, What's it broken down by yeah, we, we have that We have that we in have. the six-year plan, but we can, I don't think we provided it in these charts, but we can certainly do that. I but we like do break it down that. in the six-year plan. My advice is for everybody to see that, but, but I want to see it. I don't know if everybody else does or not. We'll get you that data. Thank you. I just add, a, yes. that's a very serious discussion, but, you know, I think part of the reason some of us really um, appreciate serving on the rail committee is that you know, DRPT is taking us through a process where we're actually trying to change the conversation about rail. And it is elevating rail in a different way for both passenger and freight. I think a lot of the points Mr. Fallon raised are important. This is a public-private partnership. And what we invest in does benefit both freight and rail. It is a network of moving goods and people around Virginia. And I think one of the things that you know, Pete Burris has been really good at always including in his presentation is the focus on those joint benefits. And I think, you know, how you set up the P3 operations on highway is a lot of how I think we should begin to negotiate, not begin, but, you know, focus on negotiating with the railroads. Um, and so it can be a win-win. Um, so, Mr. Maldon, I think that tension is not bad. I think it's a way of how we approach these negotiations. And the network's important. I mean, I think one of the things we're going to get out of the rail study is how valuable the rail network is to Virginia. 
I'm not being critical at all. I no, just, I think the question's I, important. I, I, what you the, I, just, I just see that there is potential conflicts and what, what challenges do we currently or do we see down the road having in doing those mutual benefit projects? And no, I think your question was terrific. I'm just saying that I think there, you know, because that's true, that somehow I think we need to shift how we discuss this, yeah. I'm not worried about it now that I know you're on the rail committee. Uh, no, no, here, here the, the, you know, the rail committee <laughs> is, a, I think, you know, it, it is a very positive atmosphere, and so it's hard sometimes when, so we, anyway, to be a part of those discussions where I hope that at the end of the day there is a shift. There, there's a couple things going on, and one of it is there's not a lot of documentation of long-term agreements we've had with the railroads, and they view some of the monies much differently. Uh, than we have because there hasn't been a documentation from previous administrations quite frankly of what these monies were they many of the railroads think a lot of money's in there are their money i mean they, yes. they because that they believe it and these pro these quite frankly these funds were set up because of many of their lobbying efforts uh, in terms of getting it so so it is an education that you're right exactly an education that this is a that, they, that these are state monies that we want to use for the benefit of both your freight uh, your freight operations and the rail and that's the process that we're going through but in all honesty they're pushing back a little bit because they've been used to getting quite frankly whatever they want to use the monies for I'm just going to be as honest as I can and so that's, that's part of what we're doing here because as stewards of, the, of our state monies, we've got to make sure that we're promoting our interest. And so that's part. And let me just point out to you, this is one of the reasons why I think this board, because quite frankly, this administration is, is not seen as they're waiting for the next one. Let me put it that way. I mean, there's that going on, too. I'm not just picking on these, but in a lot of things, they're thinking, you know, they're politically involved that, you know, maybe there's a better deal to be made with the next guy. So that's not to say it's good or bad. I'm just saying, but that's why we've got to get it exactly to what you're talking about. The board, this is the board, the dealing with that, uh, because that's not the way the fund's been administrated in the past. Yeah. Oh, to Ms. Mitchell's comments, the transformation that's taking place in the highway side with smart scale is also taking place with rail. And so making sure we're choosing the right project to make the investments. And we want to choose things that we can actually identify, fund, and complete. So, Ms. Oh. I, I would just add to that, when you look at really the size and the scope of the projects that DRPT has taken on in the last couple of years, it becomes even more critical that we're watching. Yeah, these are pretty significant impacts to they their are. networks. They are. They're huge, yeah. unlike yeah. what I think we've seen ever yeah. in the past. Yeah. Yeah. They're big. They're so. Okay, uh, we're going to have to take a hard break here. Uh, and I know, Steve, uh, but, but 12 o'clock is the break. <laughs> so if you don't want to come back tomorrow, Ms. Mitchell, you can do it. Okay. Okay, tomorrow. Here's something we'll, out, fig yeah. we'll figure it out, because I understand. <laughs> um, uh, because lunch is a hard break uh, over here. Now, if you guys want to have, uh, I do not, if you want to have this afterwards, come back uh, and Mr. Whitworth uh, for an hour, I would appreciate you not go. I do want to be here when Miss Brown is here. <laughs> Miss Brown and revenue sharing, I want to be part of that conversation. <laughs> But if you would like to take, we could take a break, and, and after that, if you guys want to come back, if the tours would work, where we can complete the DRPT session with that, you guys. All right, so why don't we do that, Mr. Pierce, so you don't have to come back. We'll take a break. You want to reconvene at 1? At 1 o'clock, we'll reconvene. And Mr. Whitworth, you will be in charge uh, at uh, 1 o'clock and go through that. And then I would ask that you uh, then take them back in recess after Mr. Pitter completes that, and we'll do the rest tomorrow morning. I think that would be uh, uh, good because I think you need to, our input, Mr. particularly Mr. Donahue is going to be with me, um, I think would be helpful having that. So, all right. What thought?